Back in the days when the people were fresh, it was one MC who had to pass the test. He was down by law and he's ready to play. That's right, y'all. It's high style. Yo, yo, yo. Woke up in the morning and my eggs was parked. Turn on the boom tube, sort of me and man Mars. The cops in D.C. had to play scan. Got a, one of my bands looking at recordings of friends. Answer my pants, so I danced to the door. Picked up the keys, caught a telephone call. She yelling bones in my sound spun. I'm like, rock up, cause the brother can't rise up. All I'm hearing is fly buzz. Hung up, lighting some butter. Food tight in my gutter. Got to love up to those hungry, with holes in their clothes. Bitch niggas throwing weak shit in the game. On the street, smoke, throwing leaf. On the heat. Pushes and face mushrooms, those types that fuck with me. Throw your head in the sky. H O S T Y L E. The breadwinners, the money killers, those two guys that fuck with me. Let's get the same on you. H O S T Y L E. The heavy guzzlers, the heavy hustlers, those types that fuck with me. This is serious. B I H O S T Y L E. The dumb chicks who love it, those two guys that fuck with me. Let's get this money till we die. So I max the vocal. I'm at the pinnacle of smoke signals. Trees in a tight squeeze. Night breeze, fall blow. Help my freeze. Somebody give me a light, please. Matter of fact, I got matches. I strike these. Stuff, stuff. Where you coming from? Burn the 41. Here your shorty cup. Yo, she calling me for one. She ignoring me unless she horny. And I like got some choices on me. She stops, starts smiling. Hands on her hips, balls are for me. I limped over with laughter. Told me to meet me a quarter after three and smack the on the ass. You get off the classy. If you ask me, if you ask me. And face mug shows those guys that fuck with me. Throw your head in the sky. H O S T Y L E. The breadwinners, the money killers. Those two guys that fuck with me. Let's get the same on any wire. H O S T Y L E. The heavy guzzlers, the heavy hustlers. Those two guys that fuck with me. This is silly as we are. H O S T Y L E. The dumb chicks who love this. Those two guys that fuck with me. Let's get this money till we die. So all them types that fuck with me. You being so long, the high you cool, Mike Herrall, Jerry Femmelaw, and my engineer Max. More greens, baby, to my man untouchable violence. What up? The Sabre Dude, Prince from Power Room. Yeah, to the Mob D and the infamous Mob. That's right, girl J, Nikki Brown. To my three kids, get down, baby. Yeah, so Frederick and my man Carlito. What? To all my people. Uh, the who had click, to everybody's kiss. Yo, S T Y L. Drug pushes and face mushers, those two types that fuck with me. Throw your head in the sky, H O S T Y L E. The breadwinners, the money killers, those two types that fuck with me. Let's get the same on any wire, H O S T Y L E. The handy guzzlers, the handy hustlers, those two types that fuck with me. This is serious, B I H O S T Y L E. The dumb chicks who love it, those two types that fuck with me. Let's get this money till we die. All right, and um, let's get started. Let's get started. Um, let me give a shout out to people in the chat. Favor, good evening to you. Kareem Austin, hello. Uh, Hard Fork Rich, what it do, what it do, man. Um, that Screwball, man, Screwball. Rest in peace to uh, KO, man. Uh, screwball is definitely dope in the uh, mid 2000s, early 2000s. All right, let me share my screen. Um, also, I didn't do the introduction. Welcome to uh, welcome back to uh, Black Brain Trust. This is episode 491, Space and Technology. Please hit the like button as you come in, share the video if possible, hit that notification bell so you get any updates from the Black Brain Trust and those posted on the community tab. Document description beneath the video for you to follow along with. If you want to engage in discussion, get on the panel. There'll be a link in the chat for you to click on. When you click on the link, make sure you raise your hand so that one of us can acknowledge you and advance you to the panel. All right. Let's get started. We're very late because I had a uh, extensive phone call with somebody. Um, it went further than I anticipated. So we'll fly through this docket, I think. All right. All 
All right. First item on the docket is from ngadget.com. Google's coronavirus search hub makes COVID-19 info easier to find. Expand this over. Google has launched a promised coronavirus search hub that makes looking for legit information on COVID-19 a bit less overwhelming since the information is continuously changing around the world and varies from region to region. Google is providing easy access to information from health authorities alongside new data and visualization. The hub will show uh, up when you search for coronavirus or COVID-19 on Google, whether you're on mobile or desktop. It pulls information from the World Health Organization and links to your local health authorities and it organizes what you need to know into different categories. In it, you'll see overview of the disease alongside categories that focus on symptoms, treatments, and preventative measures. It includes a carousel of Twitter accounts from your local civic organizations and health authorities, as well as a section that highlights some of the most common questions about the disease. There's also a statistic, uh, statistics category that shows the number of confined cases, deaths, and recoveries per country. The feature has started rolling out in English in the US, but Google says it plans to expand its reach to other countries and make it available in other languages soon. In addition to the new hub, Google has also launched a new COVID-19 portal in the US. It features all the information from the search hub through, uh, though you can also use it to find state-based information, safety, safety and prevention tips, as well as search trends related to the pandemic. Google also intends to make it available in more languages and regions in the future. So. I think Google has done a great job at this. Um, it's definitely to counter a lot of uh, a lot of the uh, fake news, and they treated it just like um, the, you know the uh, the portal. They treated it just like WebMD, and so it's definitely um, it's definitely a dope idea um, and probably necessary for them. All right. Uh, before you get on the panel, if you plan on getting on the panel, make sure you update your Zoom because there's a, a Zoom update that went out this morning. So, all right. All right, let me get to the next item on the docket. All right, next item on the docket is from Engadget.com. WhatsApp and WHO create a chat bot to share reliable coronavirus info. Interesting. In an attempt to help users find accurate coronavirus information, WhatsApp and the World Health Organization have launched a chat bot with, that will answer questions about the pandemic. When users text hi to the new WHO health alert, the service will respond with a series of prompts, the latest data and a few emojis. In addition to fighting misinformation on the platform, this could help. This could also help government decision makers find the latest numbers and situations reports WhatsApp says. It's actually a pretty dope idea. Yesterday, WhatsApp unveiled a coronavirus fact checking hub in partnership with the WHO, UNICEF and United Nations Development Program. That intended to share the latest news and advice related to COVID-19. The chatbot will go one step further and let users ask questions directly. WhatsApp also donated $1 million to support fact checking organization. According to the Guardian, the UK's NHS may also be developing a WhatsApp chatbot to share reliable coronavirus information. NHS already helps people in the UK find reliable uh, health info via Google, and it has partnered with Amazon on Alexa-based chatbot, so it could be well positioned to add a WhatsApp bot. While WhatsApp started as a messaging uh, service, it has grown into a social network and it's now used by over 2 billion people worldwide. It also poses a unique challenge in the fight against misinformation. Unlike other social networks and search engines, it 
its messages are encrypted and untraced. As the Guardian points out, that makes it especially difficult for WhatsApp to crack down on false claims. Last year, WhatsApp reduced its messaging, its message forwarding limit to just five people or groups in attempt to curb misinformation. And in 2018, it banned over 400,000 accounts during Brazil's election by cracking down on automated and bulk messaging activity. WhatsApp has also made it easier to prevent contracts, uh, contacts from dragging you into annoying group chats. Chatbots from reliable sources like the WHO could be another way to combat misinformation. Yeah, this is actually a pretty dope um, use of the platform. I think that um, using these VR headsets could actually add into a lot of this as well. I think Microsoft should actually get involved in sort of like the Xbox Skype sort of perspective of using Skype for that very same reason. I'm surprised they haven't come up with something like that. When I talk about VR headsets, I'm talking about the ability to put on your VR headset and have sort of like um, uh, demonstrations of how to prevent the coronavirus from spreading, such as washing your hands, what kind of methods of lathering your hands and <clears throat> other things of that major, don't touch your face and stuff like that. That's, that's where guys like, you know, Hard Fork Rich come in and he designed something like that. That's what the, that's what the bread is, man. That's what the bread is. Keep the techie what's going on. JBM 93, what's going on? We got to go on 11 on the panel. What's up, Mike? Oh, what up, man? Good man. All right. Uh, all right, let me jump to the next item on the docket. All right, this next one is from Forbes.com. How to decide if you should start or let go of your startup idea. This should be very interesting. Have you spent months thinking about whether you should pursue your idea and still not sure? You're not the only one. If you're eager and an entrepreneur, you know that this internal debate can be exhausting. On the one hand, it's important to think and evaluate your endeavor. After all, you will be committing the next few years of your life to, the, to your business. On the other hand, it can feel like an endless thought battle. Bad timing is one of the most common reasons entrepreneurs delay pursuing their startup ventures. It can feel like there is always something more important to focus on. This is not to be confused with market timing, which is important execution, which is an important execution factor that every entrepreneur should evaluate before starting. Timing and prioritization are just two examples why the decision making process to start a startup can go on for months and sometimes years. So I talked about this last year, um, maybe even before that, on here that um, everybody wants to, you know, we were having this discussion about startups last year, uh, maybe a year or so prior, maybe like 2018. But people were asking, you know, when are we going to go from just having these discussions to actually doing things? And like this last sentence points out, um, decision making process to start a startup can go on for months and sometimes years. That's not uncommon. So I think some people who, and I'm just speaking in terms of black people, they want the instant gratification of, of going into a startup, but they don't have everything really well thought out. And so there's a template that you can, you know, you can look at online or some other places and books and stuff like that for startups of the approach to actually doing this. You may have an idea, but if you don't have the right approach, it's not going to be, you know, sound, uh, um, fundamentally sound. And so that's why it's important. Some will say if you're a real entrepreneur, you wouldn't even think about it. You start. The truth is, if you're not going to commit to your venture, it's better not. It's better not to start it. Yes, this is true. The worst decision an entrepreneur can make is to invest in a startup and quit before even taking the product to market. Unfortunately, this is a common example of wasted resources when halfway through, 
Founders realize they need to spend more time or money or lose interest in the startup. This can be easily avoided. The first step is to, is to set a brainstorming deadline. This will not only push you to find answers, but also make a decision within a predetermined period. Deciding not to pursue your venture today doesn't mean you can't start it in the future. This time brainstorming phase will help you give a definitive answer to whether you will bring, uh, begin now or not. If not, it's important to free up your mind to focus on what you wanted to prioritize. If you decided to start, you will truthfully and confidently commit to turning, uh, turning your idea into a successful startup. So this is a very true statement um, and actually pretty good. Um, I'm surprised they put this into an article. Far too often is in the black community, we don't have a startup culture, we have a hustle culture. Everything's about a quick flip. That's all it is. It's always a quick flip. It's never anything innovative. It's never anything driving, um, you know, innovation and, 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 and from a sense that we're creating something new. We're always just taking a pair of sneakers, we flip them, we get the money, then we burn it somewhere else. That's, that's pretty much the business culture of being in, um, uh, in, you know, in black culture, in, in terms of black culture, whereas in other culture groups, it's not really like that, you know, it's, everything has to be kind of well thought out, but it does fail uh, very often, more often than not. That's why you hear a lot of uh, failed startups. Yeah, we, we know, I mean, oh, by the way, what up, Mike? Oh, what up, what up? Chill, man. Um, <clears throat> we're talking like hustlenomics, mm -hmm. right? See, so hustlenomics doesn't, it's not, um, it's not as intricate, it's not as detailed, it's very rudimentary. You know, it's basically, a, it's like you said, it's a flip. So I buy low, sell high, right? <clears throat> Based on very, I said, very rudimentary transactions. It's usually cash. I guess now it's cash app, but it kind of works the same way, right? Like I got some, I got some Jordans that I got for 40 or 50 bucks you know, or a homie stole them and just, just told me, give him a dub for them or whatever, whatever the case may be. It's always something that you got on the low and you're trying to flip on the high. Okay. So with hustlenomics, that's pretty much the spiel. You go, you know, you hit the dude with the J, oh, I got this, 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 boom, 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 flip the money. That's it. With startup culture, it's a little different. So there is going to be a high, a high, uh, it's going to be a higher, uh, uh, fail, uh, rate of failure because there's more things that you're trying to do and because of the things that you're trying to do your business has to be set up a certain way you got to budget things a certain way and you have to have the money and the capital to like to complete you know certain phases of projects and stuff and then on top of that there also have to be goals you got to reach in terms of market uh you know market capitation you know how like okay i put this app out q1 and what were my sales goals for Q1? You know, did I make it? Did I, did I at least make, did I make 50, 60% of it? At least some of that, whatever I made, I can go ahead and put towards money that I put out so I can kind of, you know, put the books a little bit back. And there's more you got to do, mm -hmm. you know? So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, that's why you're going to kind of get the higher, the higher rate of failure when it comes to startups, but the rewards are higher. Mm -hmm. That's the flip side of this. The rewards are higher. More income capital potential. You know, there's, you have to, when you do things a certain way, there's more, but yeah, there's, there's higher rate of failure. Guess what? There's also higher, uh, a higher return on investment. Yeah. You know, a higher return on your sweat equity. You just get higher returns. Yeah. Yeah, let me um, finish the rest of this article real quick. Um, the first step is to bring to, is to set a brainstorming deadline. This will not only push you to find answers, but also make you, uh, uh, but also make a decision within a predetermined time uh, period. Decided not to pursue your venture today doesn't mean you can't uh, start it in the future. This time brainstorming phase will help you give a definitive a definitive answer to whether you will begin now or not. If not, it's not. Sorry, it's important to free up your mind to focus on what you wanted to prioritize. If 
you decided to start, uh, you will truthfully and confidently commit to turning your idea into a successful starter. Having to set a brainstorming deadline, the second step is to run your idea by these two evaluation stages. Internal evaluation. This is the time to be honest with yourself. You know that a uh, you know that a building a that building a successful startup is not com is not a comfortable journey. It is risky but very rewarding. This is the time to put all your cards on the table, and you only have to answer three questions. Do I really want this? This is not a question about whether or not you want to be an entrepreneur. It's a question about your belief in your idea, its, pot its potential and importance for you in your life, this question will also help you understand your priorities. Why do I want it? There's no shame in building a startup for its financial reward. If you are self-funded and making money is your goal, what you need to think about and ask is if your idea will allow you to build a profitable and sustainable business quickly. If you want to raise funds, the question is, are you willing to fully commit to your venture and let go of any other jobs and responsibilities? Can I do it? There's no doubt you're going to need help. But the question is, can you hustle and find a way to overcome challenges, keeping in mind that it won't be a three or six month project, but a long term commitment? Yeah. Very good baseline for um, going at this. Um, I think a lot of people, at least from a black culture perspective, don't really think about this. You know, this is not about going to the auction and flipping cars and stuff like that. Um, this isn't about, you know, uh, barbershops and beauty, and beauty supply stores. This is about taking it to the next level about how is this going to scale? You know, we talked about SoftBank has a 500 year game plan. Okay. Half a millennia. That's how they're thinking. I don't know if you can scale your uh, your lineups and your shape ups, you know, <laughs> and stuff like that. You know, five hundred years, or half a millennia, but you know, this is how a business process works um, from the startups' perspective. Nope, totally agree. Uh -huh. All right. If you sort of want to launch a startup, don't have a compelling reason why you should start, and not sure if you want to. Uh, live its ups and downs. There is no point for moving to the next evaluation stage. Those questions would have uh, helped you set, it, uh, set your priorities so you could focus on what you believe is more important. And if you really want it, have a strong reason and willing to go above and beyond to make your startup successful. There's one more evaluation stage I highly recommend you go through. External evaluation. External evaluation focuses on the initial validity of your startup idea. This stage answers, is my idea as promising as I thought? Do people need my solution? And is it really worth com the commitment? There's only one way you could answer these questions, talking to the future buyers. Building a startup is a process. One of the few key stages is this process is idea evaluation, uh, idea validation. As an entrepreneur, you're what you're always testing, iterating, and validating hypotheses. Let the hard work of your of testing your idea start after you've decided you will pursue your venture. For now, it's just a matter of speaking with a few, few potential customers, possibly users of competing products, to learn about their needs and expectations from a new solution if there is a problem with solving. For another layer of external uh, external evaluation. Share your idea and plans with mentors and experts in this in the space. A quick chat will provide you with invaluable insights and an opportunity to run your decision to start a startup by people who can help you predict the future so you can make an educated decision. Microsoft, Twitter, Instagram, PayPal, and every multi-billion dollar company started with just an idea, and so will the next success story. If you were given unlimited shots at becoming the next success story, will you take any, any chance? How many shots are you willing to take before giving up? Even if success rates are low, remember you have unlimited shots. Yeah, I agree with this. I yeah, agree. I, do you know me business? I can't, I don't even remember, I don't even know how many businesses I've had, dude. 
Uh, how many times we come up with? Uh, uh, how many times have you, how many businesses have we thrown away? Just we've thrown it out there. <laughs> I think we've done it every single week. And I think what happens here is, um, you know, at first we were a bit apprehensive about really sharing some some of this information. We'll say we'll keep that for offline chat. But eventually we just started throwing it out there. You know, um, all forms of businesses, you know, um, we were talking about putting sneakers on the blockchain long before Nike came up with Crypto Kicks. Way before that. I wonder if they were listening in. Could, could just be a coincidence that, uh, you know, great minds think alike. We were just thinking about it. We're like, yo, wouldn't it be dope if such and such and such? Few months later, maybe a year or so later, they came out with crypto kicks. We were already talking about that. We were already talking about, you know, uh, putting weed on the blockchain. Yeah, we was just talking about various sort of putting cars on the blockchain. Yeah, uh, tokenization and stuff like that. Um, Fractionalization. Yeah, fractional ownership and shared uh, shared platforms and stuff like that. Um, and we only talked about it from a black community perspective. We didn't think about it from, you know, an every in a, a uh, inclusive perspective with everybody else. We were just thinking, what what if black people did it this 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 and this way? We were the only ones really having the conversation about reparations in the form of cryptocurrencies. Well, Mike, I gotta I gotta say though, you know, my view of it was was what we what we're doing here is what we're creating goes out into the mainstream markets, right? And, and gets customers and usership and gets a, a, a user, and gets a user base that, that basically is comprised of everyone. You know, I mean, I, I firmly believe that these, these startup clusters and things that we talk about um, should extend out into uh, the, ma- the greater mainstream commercial venue. Mm-hmm. So I've always had that thought in mind where, you know, these, these, you know, are whether they're tech products, rather, you know, applications or, you know, or whatever, whatever the case may be, or hardware products or, you know, physical products, 3D, 3D printed, you know, uh, manufactured products, whatever the case may be. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's put, it's being put out there on the open market um, to be bought, uh, to be purchased just like everything else is. I didn't, you know, I never viewed this from, uh, um, you know, you know, selling the blacks only type. I don't know. Let's, let's get, let's get a piece of the pie here. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, this one from Forbes.com. How digital apprenticeships can help employees thrive in the age of AI. Should be interesting. Bash in Silicon Valley has become one of the few things both political parties agree on this election cycle, and they have good reason. The artificial intelligence automation technology developed by the Valley's best and brightest minds is projected to displace the jobs of between one quarter and one third of American workers by 2030. The Brookings Institute estimates that 36 million Americans could have 70% of their work tasks replaced by automation. These alarming figures are attracting the attention of policymakers and politicians alike. Some are calling for a tax on robots. Others believe massive on massive open online courses are the answer to retraining millions of displaced workers. One former presidential candidate based his campaign on universal basic income to offset wage loss expected to result from mass automation. Hmm, a lot of UBI talk today. It's only a matter of time before public opinion, political uh, sentiments turns against the technology sector. It's easy to imagine how someone at the front desk of a hotel who is replaced by an artificial intelligence, or sorry, an artificial assistant will feel, or to understand the reaction of a truck driver whose job is eliminated by self-driving trucks becomes commonplace. Silicon Valley innovated this problem into existence. And now it must innovate to find a solution. AI will impact a number of jobs, so it's time to put AI to work to teach employees new skills. 
So doing so represents both a financial opportunity and a moral obligation for the tech community. There is no morality with tech. A logical solution begins with giving workers access to apprenticeships in the roles that will thrive in the next iteration of our economy. People learn best by doing things and being coached, not by sitting through hours of online courses. Indeed, trying something and then giving, uh, then getting feedback is likely how you learn how to do your job. We can't be, we can't reasonably expect someone who's been working in the factory for 20 years to magically transform into a software engineer simply because they access a web-based learning system. They need to watch and then do assisted by a real-time coach. We talked about this several times before. You know, people have said automation is going, for every job automation takes away, more jobs are going to be created. Yeah, if you are flipping burgers at, at, um, at some burger joint, some, uh, you know, some automated point of sales system isn't going to take away that cashier's job in that, in that burger flipper's job. I mean, I mean, it's not going to give that person who flips burgers in that cashier um, at that same burger joint, it's not going to give them a new job. It's just going to replace them. I gave the example about Home Depot. Last year, they went full-scale automation on their point of sale systems. Anybody can work those point of sale systems down. No, no need for a... Uh, a cashier. And so it replaced all the cashiers. It replaced about, let me see, about two dozen just, just in that one section alone at the point of sales. So you think about automation. Um, those point of sales systems did not give those cashiers a new job. They just had to go find some work somewhere else. I told these people at Home Depot before, uh, back in 2016, 2017, your job is going to be replaced by automation. And they laughed. And here we are in 2019, December of 2019, I'm going to the checkout line. There's no cash in there. I pick up a uh, barcode reader, scan my item, pull out my, um, my phone, tap and pay, and I'm gone. It emailed me a receipt. I, you know, what, what did they think was going to happen? But this is how most Black people think. They believe that the system is going to be there even though they want to tear it down, right? They want to fight white supremacy. They want to tear <laughs> down the whole entire system, right? This sort of, you know, you know, this sort of juggernaut sort of approach that they're going to smash everything, you know, that's uh, European and Caucasian. And then when they find out that the very system that they want to fight, they want to now uphold it. Or they want to put some belief behind it that it's going to be there. In I mean, so it's... Go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead, dude. I don't know what happened to your mic there. Go ahead. No, I stopped. You were, you were saying, finish what you were saying. No, I was just saying that they want to fight. That oh, no, no, no. Go ahead, dude. I was listening. No, I was just saying um, they want to fight that same system, but they also believe that the system is going to be there for them. They think it's going to be right there, and then they pay the price for it later. Those same people that were, you know, I was saying this too back in 2016, 2017. They're out of work now. You've been, you know, procrastinating all this time. You didn't, I mean, 2016 to 2019, that's an associate's degree. What have you been doing since then? And so someone who's been moving boxes in a warehouse, yeah, Amazon had uh, bought a company called Kiva Systems, which creates warehouse robots. Yep. Out all their... Warehouses. Warehouse logistics. Yeah, all the supply chain logistics is run by robots now. What are you mad about? And you know, and it's like you'll, um, you know, I, I think it. I'm trying to remember what it was on. I don't know if it was like on maybe the Young Turks or it was one of the uh, uh, news outlets on YouTube. Uh, we have like, like these Amazon workers. How they're basically just talking about how you know, how just the work environment at Amazon and shit. And that's kind of the point, man. It's, it's sort of like they, they kind of phase you out. You know, you get phased out because what they need to have, what they need to be done, robots have to do it. If you as 
an Amazon Prime member demand that everything that you buy get to you within a day and some items get to you within like three hours or six hours. Okay, you're gonna have to need, at, at, when we start getting up to that level of any robots, mm -hmm. too much too much room for human error, and you're starting what you got here. Um, you know, charge. I'm not putting- this Mike is breaking up a lot, I'm like, Oh, okay. Wait, wait, I'm sorry. Okay, I, I sound okay. No, it's still breaking up. Am I okay now? Hold on. Your mic is breaking up. How do I know now? Try it again. Am I am I all right now? Yeah. Okay. Um, no, so I'll, I'll make it short. So um, basically, you know, for the for the objectives that Amazon has in terms of package deployment. And being able to deliver goods and services and, and the type of speeds that they want to do it, man, at a certain point, they were going to have to go automated. Yeah, absolutely. However, geographic dis dispersion makes apprenticeships challenging. Those teaching the skills that will remain valuable in a post-automation world often live far from those who most need new jobs. And neither is likely to move. Indeed, geographic mobility in the U.S. is at historic lows. In 1990, 6.1 Americans moved between the uh, counties or states. In 2017, 3.6% uh, did so. Communication technologies can help bridge geographic distance, but they are not full, they are not enough to help displace, disperse workers, learn new skills. For that, we need to build digital apprenticeships. This starts by connecting a novice worker into a distributed network of people performing the same role. AI is then used to learn which approaches to the task work best in a given context and provide real-time guidance to the novice worker as they get started. As these novice workers grow and develop, their own best practices will automatically contribute to the network, improving their recommendations for everyone else working in it. For example, consider someone who is training to be a customer support representative, a, a position that anyone can hold regardless of their geographic location, but which requires skills and knowledge learned from others. AI learns how all support reps in a network respond to a specific customer's question. A question considering all the relevant contexts. It then measures how well each response performs in terms of customer satisfaction, time to resolve the issue and the like. Lastly, it identifies the best performing responses or brilliant outlier and makes recommendations based on those responses to workers learning how to deal with similar situations. This network-based apprenticeship model works massive, uh, offers massive uh, knowledge distribution to help even a novice who is learning a task uh, from afar. When deployed at scale, not only does it represent a Silicon Valley, a way for Silicon Valley to my, uh, mitigate some of the job losses it is driving, but also it is a massive business opportunity that gives companies access to talent uh, outside of its traditional hiring centers. At Emerges, we call this opportunity coaching networks and believe it represents not, all, not just the next big wave of software innovation, but also a critical tool for help in helping our country bridge the growing uh, geographic and economic divide. Yeah, um, I think it's an interesting perspective that they're taking. I'm of the, um, you know, I'm of the mindset that um, some of these jobs, you know, will be permanently lost. That you know, okay, customer customer support, those jobs. Um, the chat box, you know, through AI and machine learning. I ran into a chat bot today that was really, um, it was really good. 
<laughs> to, to, to be quite frank, it was actually really good. Um, it was an AI, it was an AI. Yeah, it was an AI bot. So I put in, it asked me a question, I, I gave it an answer and it gave me back this list of um, information that was relevant to what I was looking for. And I was like blown away by it. And then it asked me if I wanted any more help. And I was like, interesting, you know? Um, yeah, this is really, this is getting to a point where I'm seeing the scalability of this is like, it's gotta be every nine months that this is getting better. The last time I went through this um, chat bot feature, um, I was so uh, I was so ticked off by it that um, I, I kind of just went straight to customer service. But now I need to go to customer service today. And actually went to come, it actually contacted customer service for me because it was, uh, I got to a point where it, it needed to contact customer service to get a confirmation on something. So that's where we are right now. I don't know if uh, some of these jobs can actually be uh, saved through uh, digital apprenticeship, but I do think things like cybersecurity and, um, you know, uh, tech support and things like that. I think those things can be trained uh, through a digital apprenticeship, but I also think, because um, I think Apple, they used to send people straight to uh, Cupertino to get trained on, on supporting Mac. Chatbot. Yeah. But now, um, Apple. Yeah, they don't do that anymore. Yeah, Apple does all the training online. So, no, actually, for, well, for me, I, I had to, I had to go to one of their one of their sister uh, sites. Oh fuck! Well, I just okay. What well, doesn't matter? Yeah, I had to go to one of their sister sites. You know, um, and it's all like internal training. I think we were talking about that a few days ago, about like the different types of certifications. You know, like like being like like a specialty certification, like in Cisco versus like a general. You know, and you know, um, Apple kind of has their own, their own internal stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I think most most uh, tech companies like uh, HP, IBM, they all have that same set up. So. All right, this one is from Library Science Degree. USC. Edu. This was sent in from one of the. Uh, African cohorts that I met over there on the continent. So shout out to them for that, uh, this link. Let me just get this out. The internet and global mobile technology may have made it possible for libraries to reach people in rural and distressed communities in ways that were not possible before. There are six institutions that are revolutionizing how we think of libraries. Marifa centers, Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. The Arid Lands Information Network, ALIN, is a non-governmental organization that seeks to expand access to information technology to the rural areas of East Africa. It has established 15 Mararifa centers or knowledge centers in the countries of Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. Each knowledge center is comprised of either a room or a fabricated shipping container. Inside are computers with broadband internet access as well as research materials the centers are staffed with ALIN employees who are there to help community residents learn how to use the technology. They also, they are also there to help them expand the provided resources. That's very interesting. Wait a minute, man. The we the ship, bro. Shipping containers. Yeah. How how, how many how many times have, has the shipping container either been floated around? On the channel, I can't count on my hands. But, uh, <laughs> like, damn, that's actually a you're basically putting a lab inside of a box. That's what I'm saying. That's why I'm like, dude, come on, dude, really? Yeah, have they been listening? I mean, I'm not gonna say that, but damn, we, we've said this, dude. I don't know how many times, right? So, I, I, I met this person at the event and um, and she sent this to me, and so this is what I was at when I was on the continent last week. Varia Central Public Library, Northern Greece. Although the town of Varia in Northern Greece has only 50,000 residents, the Varia Central Public Library has been a pioneer in information technology since 1994. Its mobile library program brings library resources, including books, computers, and broadband internet to the residents of the surrounding rural areas, about 130,000 people. Additionally, it recently launched a new program known as Magic Boxes. 
the magic boxes are in an area of the library designed for children. The area is the area has computers with internet access and a variety of digital media. The goal of the Magic Boxes program is to teach children the digital skills that they will need to succeed in the new economy. Hmm. We talked about this. Consistently. Yeah. New York Public Library, New York City, uh, USA. The New York Public Library has a service called Ask NYPL, where a patron may call, text, or email questions to the librarians and other staff about other library services or get help with research. Although this service is designed for quick questions only, it does help people, uh, it does help busy people who don't have time to come to the library and access to the resources they need. More in depth research assistance is available for free or for a fee. Interesting. Contra Costa Con County Library, California. The Contra Costa uh, County Library has a unique program called Library at Gogo. -Go. Sounds like some kind of uh, strip club. It's a completely automated library book vending machine. Library patrons just swipe their library cards in the machine card reader, select the book or books they want to want via the touchscreen and the machine dispenses their choices. Each unit holds up to 400 books and users may borrow up to three books at a time. Returning the books is just as simple. The patron just brings them back to the kiosk from which they borrowed them. Check out the other innovative library programs like this one here. So it sounds like they've, they've conquered the red box sort of approach for uh, books. That's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. That is pretty interesting. All right, Free Library at Philadelphia. The Free Library of Philadelphia sponsors Library Hotspots, a program that is similar to knowledge centers in East Africa. Each hotspot includes several computers with broadband internet access, a printer, and research materials from the library. Staff members are on site to help community members. There are classes available too. The hotspots exist throughout the Philadelphia area and are held in various buildings from community centers to local churches. Interesting. Public libraries all over the USA and Canada. Libraries throughout the North America are taking advantage of the digital media revolution by downloading a simple application to their mobile devices or computers. Anyone with a library card can access thousands of digital books and videos from, for free. The service is made possible through, their, through cooperation between the libraries in OneDrive, a digital rights management and digital media repository firm, or OverDrive, sorry. From packing crates filled with technology to on-demand and digital access, public uh, libraries are changing the, uh, with the times. No longer constrained by the geography, these institutions are bringing their resources wherever people live. Yeah, library as a service. So that's pretty, basically what they're talking about. I think that's actually a pretty interesting concept they're doing in East Africa though. Um, We've talked about that many times on here before that that's a perspective that could be done here. And then when we bring that up, people laugh it down and say that's that's hogwash. Meanwhile. Mm -hmm. All right, next item on the docket is from stanford.edu. Why being a programmer will make you a better doctor. As an MD, PhD student whose research is more focused on machine learning and algorithmic development than on bio, uh, sorry, on biology outright, I've spent a fair amount of time thinking about the seeming disconnect between the skills I need for research and the skills I need to provide good clinical care as a future doctor. My research focuses on building predictive models of treatment response uh, treatment response and, re and relapse in pediatric cancer. So I spend most of my time writing R and Python code that wrangles, visualizes, and data collected from patients. 
Yet, despite uh, sending, uh, spending most of my time uh, programming, I know for a fact that coding is not in the top 20 skills needed to care for patients in a clinical environment. Still, a few years of experience in both contexts has shown me that some lessons I've learned from being a programmer generalized wonderfully into my life as a medical student and bode well for my future, balancing these two worlds. Here are a few of my insights. Break problems into sub-problems. With any data science or programming project, it's critical to break your overall objective into a series of smaller, more manageable objectives that you can handle one at a time. For example, if you're implementing an algorithm that has three distinct steps, an optimal strategy often involves writing code that implements each step separately, then writing a function that combines them. By doing so, you can keep your code organized, efficient, and easy to understand. I found myself applying the same principle in medicine. For instance, when taking a medical taking a medical history, it approaches it helps to approach the conversation in several discrete steps: the history of present uh, present illness, past medical history, social history, each of which corresponds to a small part of the patient's background and needs. That way, I'm able to reliably obtain all information I need without leaving out anything important. Memorization. In computer science, memor memorization is a coding technique that can be used to speed up an algorithm by reusing the answers to problems that have been solved before. In other words, a memo memorized algorithm will only take the time to solve a problem from scratch once. And every time the same problem is encountered in the future, it will simply look up the old solution like a memo instead of resolving the problem from the beginning a second time. This means that the algorithm will solve problems slowly the first time, but will be much more efficient as at solving the problems in the future. In many ways, I feel like being a medical student is a master class in memor memorization. A lot of things you learn are overwhelming at first, and you have to master the small steps to move on to the bigger picture. For example, during my first quarter of medical school, I, su I struggled to hear any, so any heart sounds through my stethoscope at all. And I had to practice with my classmates multiple times before it finally clicked. They showed me uh, what uh, stethoscope placement worked for them. And if it worked for me too, I made it a part of my process. A year later in a full cardiac exam, including listening for murmurs, rubs, and gallops, and a patient's heartbeat became reflexive to the point that I barely had to think about it. Despite slow at first, I eventually mastered each step by developing a fully memorized approach that combined what had worked for me in the past. In programming, edge cases refer to situations that you wouldn't normally expect. For instance, in a computer program that compares two numbers and tells you which one is larger, an edge case might be what happens when two numbers are identical because neither one is technically larger than the other. Generally, thinking about, the, think about and testing for edge cases is important to ensure that your code doesn't break when it sees something expected, unexpected which can cause catastrophic results. Accounting for edge cases in medicine requires the same degree of creativity and forward thinking as it does in programming. Often physicians have to engage in what if thinking to account for multiple diagnostic possibilities, even when only one or two of them seem likely. For example, my advisor and I had a case in which a patient developed a runny nose the day before starting a course of chemo chemotherapy. Based on the patient's past history of seasonal allergies and the high pollen count that day, most signs seem to indicate that there was nothing to worry about. But in order to rule out the unlikely edge case that the patient had contracted an acute viral infection that could become serious when his immune system was suppressed by chemotherapy, 
My advisor made sure to run tests for several common bugs before starting the treatment. Despite the seeming differences between computer science and medicine, I've come to appreciate their similar, uh, their, their many similar ways of thinking. Among these are a shared commitment to creativity, thoughtfulness, and efficient problem solving. For those reasons and more, I'm hopeful that even though I'm unlikely to use my coding skills on that on, on the words directly, being a program will ultimately make me a better physician. I think this is actually a really good article. Um, actually a really good blog, but uh, it's a blog post, but it's still a great uh, piece. Dr. Phoenix has talked about this many times before. Shout out to Dr. Phoenix. He talked about the need for people going into, um, into healthcare to have a dual background in uh, information systems or computer science while being in, you know, going to school for our, um, you know, um, nursing and other forms of uh, medicine. And that how, um, how greatly this would be used uh, in, in terms of uh, bettering yourself. So, yeah, it was mainly the area of pharmacogenomics. Yeah. Right. Like, you know, the sequencing and of, uh, you know, DNA and all that, you know, DNA profiling and all that type of stuff, all that stuff uses software and applications, you know? So, um, yeah, there was that whole angle. And by the way, Evan, I did get in contact with my, my buddy, Evan. So when he gets back in town, we're going to schedule that, uh, that cannabis live stream. Uh, we'll argue with Dr. Phoenix and I'll, I'll put, I'm going to put it all together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that, I think that piece is really, really good. Uh, you know, I can't really say much more to it other than what's already been said. Um, you can't just come with one, you can't be a one trick pony out here anymore. Even in cybersecurity, you can't be a one trick pony. I mean, you could never be that before, but you, you really can't be a one trick pony in IT. You got to be able to do uh, more than one thing at a, um, at a time or have a better under coming from two different backgrounds. Most people in, um, in cybersecurity have an extensive business and IT background. And so their ability to sequence into cybersecurity really comes from um, having a very, uh, a very challenging background somewhere else. Uh, for example, Gabe A has a um, background in electrical engineering and worked in a nuclear facility. So for him, that would, you know, cybersecurity was just a natural progression. So they come from this sort of, you know, uh, background that is um, always uh, similar in sort of the nature, but not the same exact industry. And so that's, you know, you know, I can't stress enough, man. People don't really take that into consideration. I have a, Another colleague that I um, I spoke about before, who used to work um, in Detroit at the uh, in, in uh, one of the big three auto manufacturers, and he went back to school at night while he worked in auto manufacturing uh, on the assembly line, and got his degree in um, electrical engineering or you know, computer engineering, and actually um, now works for Intel. Intel picked him up after he graduated. It, he's now a lithography technician, you know, he makes high six figures now. Um, you know, he was making whatever he was making on the assembly line, but imagine going from 30 bucks an hour to damn near uh, 150 to $200,000 in salary, you know, that, but because of his background in manufacturing and, and understanding the process and OSHA standards and, and OSHA compliance and things of that nature, he was almost a natural fit for uh, building processors inside these um, fabrication places um, that Intel has in Arizona. And so he had that dual background. It doesn't sound like much, but it actually helped him transition into it. And that's why they picked him up because he came from that background. All right. All right, this is from Forbes.com. 
When strategy leads, success follows. Tips for keeping up in the fourth industrial revolution. In a famous episode from Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass, Alice finds herself running hand in hand with the Red Queen. Yet, no matter how fast they run, the scenery around them stays the same. They haven't made any progress at all. Apparently, in this strange country, Alice finds herself, it takes all the running you have just to stay in the same place. And if you actually want to get somewhere else, you have to run twice as fast as that. Sounds like the Black community. The Red Queen's lesson can be applied to business innovation today. One of the key components for business success in the fourth industrial revolution is the embrace of disruptive technologies and implementation of holistic strategies that take advantage of these technologies across the organization. Yet Deloitte's global, uh, Global's report, the fourth industrial revolution at the intersection of readiness and responsibility found most businesses are eschewing disruption and comprehensive industry 4.0 strategies. Just 10% of executives say their companies have longer range strategies for how to leverage new technologies that broadly reach across the organizations. And when asked to rank the top outcomes they hope to achieve with their fourth, uh, with their industry 4.0 investments, only 3% of leaders selected disrupting our industry as a top five choice. Hmm. Industry 4.0 investments, that's actually a good term. By ditching disruption and long-term strategies in favor of a short-term focus, companies run the risk of continuously scrambling to keep up with the changing scene around them versus making any real ground. Even worse, they are potentially luring themselves into a false sense of security and exposing themselves into greater, a greater chance of disruption in the medium term. Companies can't distance themselves from the pack by playing defense. To truly get ahead of competitors, dis different rotation and disruption need to be priorities and they can be obtained by implementing the right strategy to transform their business model. According to Deloitte's, to the Deloitte Global's readiness report, businesses with comprehensive industry 4.0 strategies are far more successful across the board. They are innovating and growing faster, doing a better job of attracting and training the people they, they'll need in the future and their executives are far more, uh, sorry, are more confident about leading the industry 4.0 era. They are also satisfying increasing demands regarding social impact and climate change. Moreover, successful long-term strategies also create financial gains. According to the report, nine uh, in 10 companies will, with holistic industry 4.0 strategies saw at least 5% re uh, annual revenue growth in 2019. Talented employees, strong leaders, innovation and growth are what companies need to survive and win long-term. I wanna read that again so that the people who are conservative understand what we're saying. Talented employees, strong leaders, innovation and growth are what companies need to survive and in a, in win uh, long-term. When you have holistic strategies, you can do better you can't do a better job of broadly leveraging game-changing technologies throughout your, or, your operations. Considering all of these businesses, uh, this, these business benefits, why then do most companies surveyed have no formal strategy or take ad hoc approaches for incorporating industry 4.0 technologies? They're running in place. Short-term thinking continues uh, to the disadvantage of many organizations as Nearly a third of executives said integrating 4.0 technologies into their operations was not that important. This could be because some leaders may not yet appreciate the implications or the implications of industry 4.0 or its potential benefits, at least for their own businesses. If a business is focused only on the short term, quarterly earnings and near term investor demands it's harder to justify longer term strategies or investment in technology. Yeah, this is very true. Um, this is very true. Many companies like Palm and um, who created the Palm Pilot, they did not see the writing on the wall. They just couldn't get it right. Um, they refused to actually uh, think further ahead and, um, and they eventually got swallowed. So 
Yeah, it's kind of like what happens when man when you believe in your patents a little bit too much. Yeah. You know, you really do try to hunker down and try to, you know, go big on your platform instead of like looking into the future and saying, mm, we may need to start thinking about this and considering this and you might have to start prototyping stuff, you know? Yeah. But yeah. And Deloitte's and Deloitte Global's 2019 readiness report about a third of leaders further cited a lack of leadership vision, too many technology choices, organizational uh, silos, and lack of internal strategic alignment, and a, and a short-term focus on revenue as challenges to implementing industry 4.0 technologies. And from a talent perspective, only 10% of the executives said they understand what skills will be needed in the future. In many cases, executives find it difficult to predict the future in this era of constant change and disruption. Yeah, but if you had a, a better, uh, um, you see, the, the issue I see, in, especially in this description here, is that you have capitalists and you have technocrats. And the capitalists are, don't, uh, the capitalists lack the vision that the technocrats have. And see, the, te the capitalist wants to put revenue first, the technocrat wants to put um, the technology first, okay, the constant innovation of technology first or innovation first and, and worry about the revenue later. And so you look at Facebook, Facebook went multiple quarters without turning revenue before they actually turned revenue for the first time. They actually went seven, seven plus years without turning revenue. So should they have scrapped it or, or should they have stayed the course? They stayed the course and now um, turn the revenue. Well, I was going to say, not only that, but you got to a point where the threat of also having your own bank, like, do, do, do you realize just how powerful and valuable, like, Facebook uh, actually is? It's just like you said, well, what would have happened if they didn't stay the course? Well, <laughs> that. You know, like think about when you do stay the course, how big your business comes. You you don't you really don't know, man. Like there's a term that's actually being thrown out here now, uh, because of this whole virus thing, right? It's called exponentiality. Okay. Um, it's kind of like when something when you start something and then you scale it up by 10, right? And then you scale it up by 10 again. Now think about what you just did there. You scaled up by 10 first, but then you scaled that 10 up by 10. And that's how we really have to kind of look at like growth in terms of a company, especially like startups, man, they can grow so fast. You know, so um, there is a, there's a logic and a reason behind why a company that isn't turning a profit is extremely valuable. Is because there's gonna you're gonna you're gonna reach a point where that company will then become entirely too valuable, if it makes sense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Long-term strategies require long-term investments and necessitate both patience and foresight. For many. Uh, for example, many companies show a lack of patience with artificial intelligence, but AI requires the right base technologies, well-structured data, and an understanding of how to interpret that data, and knowledge of how business models should adapt to the information and insights gained. With those insights, there remains some disillusion that causes some companies to primarily view AI as a tool to get short-term efficiencies and cost reduction. That's a mistake. Those who take the time to in, took the time and invest over the long term can actually look at how AI can uncover huge customer insights, which can be used to thrive a real shift in the business model and build customer intimacy. To help businesses respond to fears about new technologies and disruption to get and to get better at achieving long-term goals, Deloitte created a six by six methodology, which helps executives marry the six year 
vision of where they want to be within a six month vision of near term necessities. Companies can improve their chances of not only differentiating themselves from competitors, but also disrupting their industries if they have a long term vision. Yet they also need to have checkpoints along the way to keep it uh, to keep track of and address their short term needs. That's an agile framework that they're talking about there. Hmm. Below are long and short term tips from Deloitte's Global 2020 Readiness Report to help uh, business leaders create a holistic industry 4.0 strategy. Uh, conduct audits to assess gaps and opportunities for industry 4.0 technologies. Create leadership roles focused on industry 4.0. Yeah, this is very true. Um, I saw an article um, maybe a few weeks ago, and they and they called this person the um, chief AI officer. Never heard of that before. Unheard of. Chief AI officer. Chief AI officer. Yeah, you used the to have. AIO. Yeah, you used to have a uh, CTO, a chief technology officer, but now. Yeah, I was going to say now it's a CAIO. Yeah, well, it's according to the emerging technologies of 4.0, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. And so you start talking about autonomous vehicles. Okay, who's the chief uh, auto uh, uh, autonomous uh, vehicle officer or chief EV officer or something like that? Like, that's the way the market is moving. And I think companies that fail to adapt um, to have that sort of committee set up um, where you have these sort of broken up, you know, uh, responsibilities for each and every technology, um, they fail. You know, um, it, it's, you're not going to get a return on investment immediately. This is for the long term. Somebody has to plan the strategy out. One person can't carry the weight on their shoulders for the whole entire industry 4.0 because there's so many varied technologies. You, so you kind of almost have to, you, you kind of almost have to kind of quasi- create sub companies right that, sub that so yeah so what they do is like a subunit yeah there we go um and then so that sub that subunit literally kind of has like an organizational structure just like a kind of like a regular company and, and it's kind of like the same thing that subunit or sub company um has its own business objectives which then feed into the greater Okay, but that they have to basically go about troubleshooting and problem solving the technology. And they, they have, like I said, they have to kind of have a company vision in within that unit itself in order to sort of see that long term that you're talking about. Like when you don't have that, you know what you happen, you know what you have, you basically got directives coming from up, you have directives coming from up top, you have instructions, right? You have instructions coming from top from from uh, from people that are not on the ground. Right, they're not there with it. They're yeah. looking at g larger data and then they're extrapolating and then saying, okay, uh, what solves this problem? Oh, that, okay, we need that. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. but yeah, it's not, it's not more fo focalized. Well, right? because- not, yeah, well, go ahead. Well, because before you had these sort of capitalists in perspective, right? You know, chief finance officer, chief, Officer operations, chief compliance, chief. Right. These are these are the capitalist sort of position. With 4.0, you have all of these sort of emerging technologies that need their own sort of um, uh, directive, and so you are moving away less from the capitalist era of operate of, uh, of leadership now to a more technocratic sort of framework and say now you need a chief digital officer, a chief AI officer, uh, you know, chief cybersecurity officer, all, all of that matters now. I see mm -hmm. yes, some companies use CIOs and stuff like that, but now it's becoming a lot more uh, serious. Companies who- Yeah, like a chief, but, chief autonomous technology officer. Uh, autonomous technology? Yeah, like cars and stuff. Well, that would that would be, you know, a, a CTO. But, is that going to CTO? Yeah, that falls on the CTO. CTOs don't get a lot of uh, uh, a lot of mention because so many companies don't really need them. Your CIO usually replaces your CTO. Mm, okay. 
Yeah, C CTOs are, are usually very sparse. Um, create leadership roles. Um, yeah, we've written over that. Uh, update business models to prepare for industry 4.0. Yeah. We, we just, we were literally just saying that. Yeah. Establish dedicated teams focused on innovation. Yeah, we were just saying that. Uh, more than 80% of high growth organizations have such teams according to the wage readiness report. Yeah. Um, a lot of companies, those 20% of the companies that did not do that will be the ones to fail or they'll get swallowed up. Um, it is what it is. Provide incentives for its suppliers and partners to adopt industry 4.0 technologies. This step will help key partners run at pace, uh, run at the pace the business sets. Just 13% of CXOs, I, I, I forget what that even means now, CXO, uh, said their organizations have this condition, but the fastest growing companies are ahead of the curve. Yeah. CXO. I think that just means uh, chief anything officer. Um, chief fill in the blank officer. Yeah. Yeah, so I think this is actually a pretty good article. I don't I don't see much wrong with this. I can't um, really fault it anywhere. Um, makes a lot of sense to me. Four point oh investments. Interesting. Yeah, that that would be like um, the startage and stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, equity, uh, uh, equity crowdsourcing and stuff like that, you know, into mm -hmm. startups like that's, you know, fra uh, uh, a fractionalized uh, shareholdership. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's all that for uh, 4 4.0, um, you know, investment. That's basically, yeah, fintech, all that, all that shit. Yeah. Yeah, I, I wonder if like, you know, Manosphere 3.0, you know, does it have like a, uh, you know, a, a chief, you know, anti maggle officer or something like that? Just really, you gotta think outside of the box sometimes. Um, is, it, is it MOT? <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> I guess. Shout out to MOT. Yeah. All right. This one is from NewYorkTimes.com. Big rigs begin to trade diesel for electric motors. Track the trailer fleets will take time to electrify and startups and established truck makers are racing to get their models on the road. Chino, California, the turning radius took some uh, getting used to. So did the gigantic steering wheel, but the electric version of the freight line at Cascadia big rig was otherwise easy to drive as I navigated the warehouse parking lot, dodging delivery trucks for Amazon, and J.B. Hunt. Being 80 feet long, it didn't quite feel, I'm uh, sorry, it didn't quite offer the golf cart experience I was promised when it regular driver, Carl Williams, let me take over the controls, though the acceleration was effortless, I bet. There was no stick shift to wrestle, no def, uh, deafening diesel engine, just a pair of buttons to turn it on and release the air brake, and I was off. Anybody can drive one, Mr. Williams said moments before a middle-aged mom proved his point. Mr. Williams has been a truck driver for 22 years, logging at least a, 20, a million miles with diesel power. Since December, he has been testing the battery electric e-Cascadia as part of a pilot program in Southern California. It's beautiful, he said. You don't go home with your ears ringing every night. Two years ago, the e-Cascadia was nothing more than a PowerPoint presentation, a virtual rendering to expedite a diesel Star Wars into a zero emission future for goods movement. Wait, it was, you said three years ago, it was just a PowerPoint? It wasn't even like an actual prototype? Two years. Two years ago. Bro, it, I, might, I might need to get back on this EV shit, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not even playing. A virtual rendering to expedite a diesel Star Wars into a zero emissions future for good in, for goods in uh, movement. Now it's one of several competing models from startups as well as established truck makers 
that are gearing up for production next year with real world testing. Orders have poured in from companies eager to shave operating costs and curb emissions for trucks that won't see roads for months or even years. Volvo Trucks North America announced this year that it would test 23 of its VNR battery electric heavy duty trucks in and out of the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach. The Washington based truck maker Kenworth is already there, operating the beginnings of the project portal, a 10 truck fleet of semis powered by hydrogen fuel cells. And Daimler Trucks North America is making deliveries in 20 of its pre production e Cascadias with two partner programs, uh, uh, companies, Penske Truck Leasing and NFI. We want them quicker and we want them quicker than the manufacturers can produce them, said NFI's president. Like Ike Brown, NFI, a freight hauler based in New Jersey, has been operating 10 e Cascadias between the port complex and uh, port complex, the country's busiest, and its warehouse in Chino, 50 miles inland. Mr. Brown's company makes regional deliveries using a, re a fleet of 4,500 mostly diesel trucks. That's a lot of fucking trucks. With a, uh, with a defined daily route of about 250 miles and trucks that return to the same place every night to recharge, every, uh, electric trucks just make sense, Mr. Brown said. Medium and heavy duty trucks are responsible for about 8% of the country's greenhouse gas emissions according to the Environmental Protection Agency. Electrics not only reduce tailpipe emissions to zero, they cost less to operate. With fewer moving parts, they are also easier to maintain. On average, it costs about $1.38 per mile to operate a diesel truck, according to the Trucking Information website, truckinfo.net. 70,000 or the $180,000 annual operating cost is fuel. MOT talked about this before. He said he spends about 60K on fuel. And $15,000 goes towards maintenance. Tesla, by comparison, estimates its electric semi, uh, semi will cost $1.26 per mile. Hmm. Electric trucks do, however, cost more to buy up front, while most manufacturers have yet to set pricing. The longer a truck's range, the more batteries it needs and the, and the more it will cost. Tesla plans to sell its 300 mile semi for $150,000 and 500 mile semi for 180,000 miles. The price of a new diesel tractor and trailer is about $150,000. Our goal is to get them within 10% of what a diesel would cost. So fleets can see the return on investment of reduced fuel and maintenance costs within two to three years said Dakota Semler, a co-founder of Zos Trucks in North Hollywood. The company plans to go into production with its ET1 electric semi next year. Already Zos is making smaller medium, uh, uh, medium duty trucks, electric trucks for the armored car company Loomis and UPS. Hmm. Yeah, this is um. Yeah, this is interesting, man. Um, I mean, the thing about it is, man, is you also got to look at the outgrowth of it, right? So, within three to five years, batteries will be cheaper, right? So then, there's that part. So now the cost will come down and then you still have the reduction in maintenance costs and things of that sort because of the electric motor. So when you just look at it as a long-term prospect, when you look at how long trucks are typically in service for, you got trucks that have been in service 20 years, 20 years plus. Okay. If you look at the, you take an electric truck with that same lifespan, for example, man, you get way more out of it for the cost than you would with a diesel. And I think that's what he, that's what he's really, uh, I think it was Musk in that article, he's really, what Tesla's trying to point out essentially, the viability of an electric truck over a diesel truck. But like, even if you expand it out over the, cause they, they I think in the article it referenced two to three years, 
Like that was the span that it gave it. But push it out to 10 years. Then you then you really see it over time. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let me jump to the next item on the document. We're almost finished. All right, this is from space.com. NASA's Voyager 2 probe is on its own in interstellar space until 2021. NASA is upgrading the big radio dish in Australia used to being commands to Voyager 2. Who would have known that NASA would have um, any sort of operations going on in Australia? Like I always thought that they always just use US, uh, uh, US um, territory you know, for the operation. I, I didn't realize they would go outside of the US like that. But you have mm. a problem, you know, I have a problem with China putting up a uh, telescope in uh, Argentina though, it's interesting. Well, yeah, I was gonna say, I think it has to do with, you know, whatever type of uh, agreements or treaties we have on the table with Australia. Mm -hmm. You know, if it includes some sort of space treaty, mm -hmm. you know. NASA's Voyager 2 probe will have to fend for itself in interstellar space for the next 11 months or so. NASA is upgrading the 230 foot wide radio dish in Australia that mission team members used to send commands to Voyager 2, which launched in 1977 and entered interstellar space in November 2018. Voyager 2 will be on its own until that work is done by January 2021 though the spacecraft will still be, be able to beam science data home. I find it interesting that they, they rely on one radio telescope. Why wouldn't they have another telescope uh, um, in space already? Like, it, it, don't you have something circling the earth already that could actually capture all that data that's being transmitted? Why should it just go lost? I just find that to be weird. Uh, what, where's the redundancy in it? But it's got to be super old, man. The technology has got to be super old on it. It's just shooting basically a laser, um, a weak one at that, um, to send information back. Really, really interesting stuff that NASA does. I mean, I, you know, I guess as long as, you know, data is data, right? You know, you can always try to get new devices out. And I think this is where NASA now has had to rely on, you know, private contracting basically in the form of a SpaceX and Blue Origin and God knows all the other ones to do it, you know, and because what what new tech is NASA really responsible for at this point in terms of deployment? Uh, rovers. Right? Huh? What's that? Rovers. Yeah, but I'm talking about in terms of like satellites and all that type of shit, man, that, that, that's, uh, um, you know, like the Starlink stuff and all. I mean, NASA really basically just has their own old shit that's still up there, and that's pretty much it. Yeah. Don't worry, but don't worry too much about Voyager 2. It should be able to handle its extended isolation, mission team members said. We put the spacecraft back into a state where it will just it will be just fine, assuming that everything goes normally with its with it during the time that the antenna is down. Voyager project manager who also serves as director of the Interplanetary, Interplanetary Network Directorate at NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, said in a statement, if things don't go normally, which is always a possibility, especially within an agent spacecraft, then the onboard fault protection that's there can handle the situation. It's amazing that they thought that you know, in the 1970s, they thought of all of this uh, sort of redundancy work that they um, that is implemented. But this is a picture of the um, the radio telescope. I think it's massive. The Australian radio dish is part of the deep space network. The system NASA uses to communicate with its many space probes. There are three DSN sites, one 
each in California, Spain, and Australia. Each site has multiple big antennas. For example, the Australian complex, which lies about 25 miles southwest of Can Canberra, also features three 111-foot 11, wide radio dishes. The 111-foot uh, footers can receive science data, but only the 230-foot one has the special transmitter required to beam commands to Voyager 2. The California and Spain DSN sites are no help in this regard either. Voyager 2, which is currently more than 11 billion miles from Earth, is uh, moving downward relative to our planet's orbital plane and therefore can be hailed only from southern, the southern hemisphere. Interesting. The big Australian dish has been operating for 48 years and needs the upgrade, NASA officials said. The agency decided to start the work now. The upgrade is scheduled to begin in early March, according to a uh, Wednesday NASA statement. This is very interesting, man. Um, I'm kind of mad I didn't major in uh, planetary sciences. Yeah, uh, you know, man, when I was a kid, dude, I wanted to be, um, I, want, I wanted to be a, a meteorologist. Like I'm talking about when I was like three, four years old, man. I used to like tell my parents all the time I wanted to be uh, a me I wanted to be a weatherman. Uh, like out here in Los Angeles when I was a kid, there was the weatherman on, on a, like we used to watch uh, CBS News. And the weatherman was this dude named Maclovio Perez. And so I don't know, I was just like kind of enamored with that dude, man. Every time he came on to like, you know, say what the weather was going to be. And like, I don't know, I just became like a weather junkie, man. So I probably have some videos, dude, on my, even on my channel where I talk about like being able to kind of feel like the weather coming in off the ocean and stuff. Um, but I always want, yeah, meteorology, man. I always wanted to kind of, that was always an interest of mine. Yeah, I think everybody should have a, um, a second career, man, um, if all else fails. Mo they say most human, uh, most people, uh, change their career three times in their life. So, all right, this is from the dailybeast.com. Scientists found oil on Mars. An American and German astrobiologist has found oil on Mars, and where there's oil, there's usually life. Technically speaking, Dirk Schultz and Jacob Hines didn't find oil, rather they found organic compounds called theophenes that are also present in crude oil, coal, and truffles. Theophene molecules include four carbon atoms, uh, carbon, carbon atoms and sulfur, sulfur atom in a ring-like shape. There are lots of ways of theophenes get created. Not all of them are biotic. Biotic, uh, meaning they involve life, but many of them are biotic. And if there's, if that's the case with the theophanes, Schultz and Heinz found on Mars, then the discovery could be proof of well alien life. Okay, wait a minute, dude. Real quick, I, I for the life of me, bro, what is a truffle? I always you know, I only know it from uh, Drake and uh. His hit song, you know, Truffle Butter. <laughs> I mean, no, like for real, like a, like a legit truffle, right? Like these things, like they sell for a crap ton of money and people dig them up out of the ground. And then when you read this article, it was like, okay, these things that they don't, they, they detected on Mars have the same compounds in them as, what was it? Oil, uh, oh. coal and truffles. Mm -hmm. and I'm, I, 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 for the life of me, I've always wondered what the hell a truffle was. Mm -hmm. I still don't know. Hey, hey, you know, some. I, I just wanted to ask this. What up, uh, uh, I just wanted to ask this. What's going on? What's going on? Um, these would be um, arom uh, oil, aromatic uh, 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 hydrocarbons. I, I'm, you know, the only way you get oil here on this planet is um, from you know, 
old forests and animals and so forth that that died, you know, many, many, many uh, eons ago. And um, and they, they, they uh, underground, they pressure and so forth. Uh, you know, as, as they as 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 they broke down, they they, they turned into this oil type of uh, um, uh, base. I, it's 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 pure it's purely biotic um that's why they call it fossil fuels um what is this what are the what is this oil like is it is it similar to an oil here on the, on, on this planet is, no is it it's similar? saying it's, it's if saying it is, that uh no what it, what it said was is that they didn't find oil they found they detected compounds that uh, oil, like like oil and what we find here, the same type of compounds that are in oil they detected there. So that that's happens. kind of that's kind of the connection they made. Poly polyaromatic hydrocarbons, aromatic hydrocarbons. Uh, yeah, that's I, I think that's very significant. Um, that that that's very th that could be um, construed as somewhat of a footprint, maybe. Or fingerprinted. Yeah, that, that's very significant. All right, you guys go ahead. Theophys right. turned up in dried up mud that NASA's Curiosity rover dug up in Mars and Mars's Gale's crater. Uh, Curiosity landed on the red planet in 2012 and has spent the last eight years rolling around Mars, periodically pausing to scoop up samples and uh, analyze them and beam the raw data back to Earth. Shows are uh, from Washington State University and Heinz from Berlin's uh, Universität studied the numbers from Curiosity and concluded the Martian dirt held theophanes. They published their findings this month in the science journal Astrobiology. The astrobiologists can't say for sure what uh, what produced the Martian theophanes on Earth. Theophanes often result from the eons long process of fossilization, plankton living, dying, sinking to the floor, uh, to the seafloor, getting buried in pre and pressure cooked into oil. So Nagon is right. But theophanes can also result from a non-organic process called thermochemical sulfate reduction, which involves heating up certain compounds to hundreds of degrees Fahrenheit a meteorite impact could spark thermal chemical sulfate reduction. The best Schultz and Heinz could do was identify all the ways the Ophines might have gotten into the Martian dirt. We identified several biological pathways for theophanes that seem more likely than chemical ones, but we still need proof. If you find theophanes on Earth, then you would think that uh, then you would think they are biological, but on Mars, of course, the bar to prove that has to be quite a bit higher. To prove that Martian compounds came from some kind of alien life, Scholes and Heinz would have to find the parent molecule. In other words, tiny fragments of the Martian equivalent of Earth's plankton tissues that over a million years eventually became oil. Hmm. Just don't count on curiosity to do some of the to do the heavy lifting. The decade old rover doesn't have the equipment to handle really delicate samples. Curiosity gathers a lot of its data by way of uh, pyrolysis, gas chromatography, uh, chromatography. Uh, uh, in essence, it burns up samples and analyzes the resulting gas. The extreme heat the process requires can wreck the very thing it's examined. The example in the, uh, the example in which Scholes and Heinz found their theophanes reportedly was a bit damaged. So there's a, um, oh, okay, they, they're kind of hitting on us. But what I was going to say was that there's an opportunity to create another rover that could actually help in this area. A better rover is coming in 2022. The European Space Agency plans to launch its Rosalind Franklin Pro, named for an English chemist who helped define the molecule structure of DNA. 
Rosalind Franklin is a decade uh, newer than Curiosity in most better instruments. Hmm. Of course, there's no guarantee that the ESA will, uh, the ESA probe will make it all the way to Mars and safely deploy on the red planet's dusty surface. Dusty Negro. The next critical step is whether ESA manages to land their rover. So this is very interesting, man. Um, you see, the problem with Mars exploration is that there's only one major agency up there that's doing all the work. And so, <laughs> You have a different, you're having, you know, trickles of information coming down, but at the same time, um, I, I, I just think that this should be a global effort um, to uh, contribute to this type of stuff. Like, there shouldn't just be one rover up there. There should be like a dozen of them, like gangbusters or something like that, just going buck wild looking for yeah like like almost like these little bots rolling around collecting all types of different data and stuff yeah well, you know, special types of spectrometers and different different devices on there like gathering different things yeah yeah i i just like i said before man i always thought that i know that uh when i went to the continent man they had, we was having a conversation about um space exploration, and they said it's mighty interesting that you bring that up because they have a new program that's been developed through the AU for space exploration. So yeah, I think we actually covered that in an article, man. They talked about um, space being uh, one of the issue, one of the topics on the docket. Yep, yep. And so it's an opportunity for black people to get ahead. You know, um, you know, they, they're designing electric trucks, you know, from a PowerPoint presentation to two years later to, to be in full production. So. Like I said, man, I don't know, man. I might have to, I might have to uh, dust off these, them, them, uh, them blueprints, bro. Two years to production? Yeah, from PowerPoint to production. What's going on? Uh, po the PowerPoint shit for me has already been done, man. That's what I'm talking about. Johnny Blaze, what's going on? Hey, what's going on, Mike? Complex, Nagon, how you guys doing? Good, 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 bro. Hey, I just wanted to comment on that truffle. I, I had to look it up myself just now. It's some kind of uh, some kind of fungus. Mm -hmm. Truffle? Yeah, it, it's uh like the uh, the fruiting part of a fungus. Yeah, that, that that's what it is. Um, that's why they're grown. They have some like really crazy uh, aroma. That's why they're so expensive. Mm. Yeah, because I don't think I've ever had one myself, so I, I have no idea. But there's truffle, truffle butter, and all this other stuff. <laughs> Yeah, dude. And I mean, it's like, it's super expensive. And I'm yeah. like, what, what is it, man? Is it some, some, some sort of high you get from it or some shit? I don't know. But like I said, but uh, from what I read, these things, they're buried in the ground. They take a while to harvest. Then they, uh, you can, you, you can train a dog or a pig to go find these things when they're ready. Yeah. Pigs and dogs, uh, little, little terriers. Yeah. Little dogs and terriers and shit. Yeah. But hey, but back to that whole Voyager thing, man. And I, I put a thing in the comment in, in the chat. But I'm surprised they haven't built some kind of like a midway, uh, some, some kind of way station, you know, to like, you know, uh, I, I guess something between us and the outer part of the solar system that maybe help with these boosting signals back and forth. That, that's been, that's always been my thing. Like, why why only build this big 230 foot? radio telescope in one area i mean if anything is to happen an earthquake or a war or something like that you, you, you lose that telescope you're you're screwed yeah uh -huh. you're, you're screwed and i mean I, I know we got the international space station but i i mean you're gonna need something that's out further than that at least to like you know maybe the orbiter of round either the asteroid belt maybe jupiter 
Um, but I think, you know, maybe setting up something like that along the way, let's just say we're trying to go to Mars or other planets, at least you can have these things out there. You can have supplies already set for someone in, in the event of some kind of emergency. I mean, we talked about um, like, like, you know, asteroid mining, right? And asteroid utilization. And again, people thought we were crazy, but that would be one use of an asteroid. Oh, or, absolutely. You know, you know what I mean? Or like a sort of like a, 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 a orbiting, uh, you know, just like a, an ob a stationary object in, s in space that's out there, like that's in the form of like a rock or some shit. Yeah, you, you do is you you would take that, that you would basically uh, uh, retrofit it, uh, you know, build a station into it, basically. That's where the whole sort of uh, space real estate industry and all that crazy stuff, you know, Mike was talking about some time back, him and Keep It Techie. That's yeah. where all that comes into play. Airbnb out in space. Have you watched this show on uh, Amazon called The Expanse? <laughs> Man, that we was a first, big thing we were talking about, I think, in 2018, was it, Mike? Yeah, when we first started the channel, we were supposed to do a um, an Expanse series. Okay. Uh, of, of analysis on the show, man, and it never. Yeah, really that was Lionel. Lionel's Lionel was like he was big on that one. Him and uh, I think Super Triz. Okay, uh, so I've watched all four seasons. I love it. Yeah. Well, yeah. you have, you'd have to kind of put us up on game, man. About like you know, what well, everything you guys have just talked about. That's basically what the expanse is all about. The whole premise, asteroid mining, you know, colonization. But it, it, it's like the short version. There are three governments. There's Earth. There's Mars, there's the belt. Okay, and, and it's all about the resources. Okay, and basically you have the haves and the have nots all over again, now in space. Wait a second, the have and have nots. Are you saying like there's, there's like a, a a pookie in space or something like that? Oh, bro, <laughs> you got some definitely uh, select and non selects in the expanse. Oh, man. Oh man, I gotta see that man. I have it in my uh, my Netflix uh, list, but um, yeah, I just haven't had a whole time, a lot of time to get to it. But now that we're this coronavirus, man, I think I may very well get to that. Um, yeah, you know, you know, I got I got a Netflix uh, joint, and I don't even be using it, man. I don't know, maybe I, maybe I need to go ahead and try it. Well, it. Yeah, it's it's gonna be on Amazon, uh, Amazon Prime. If you got that. Yeah, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, uh, but like I said, you know. But when you look at that series, the stuff with you, that we're talking about here, the whole uh, asteroid mining, trying to, you know, get to the different planets and you, you see how and it's it, this is not Star Trek by no means. I mean, it, it's not this is all a lot of this is based in science fact. You know, everything is like uh, how signals travel in real time, you know, the, the, the delay, all that stuff is, is all relative in that series. Yeah, yeah. It's a, how long is the series, if you don't mind me asking? Um, let's see. What so there are four seasons. Uh, I like think they're like uh, they're about forty-five minute shows. I think they're like thirteen episodes a se between ten and thirteen a season. Okay, I, I think I, I might have to uh, get started on that, man. Yeah, uh, yeah. You can get yeah. You can get through a season in, in like two weekends. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Let me let me knock out this next article okay. real quick on Forbes.com. How is the AI helping? to commercialize space. Even before modern computers became a reality, science fiction gave us a plethora of exa examples of artificial intelligence and smart robots in the context of outer space. From HAL in 2001 Space Odyssey and the computer on Star Trek to C-3PO and R2-D2 in Star Wars, and even the fantastic machines in Hitchhiker's Guide to the galaxy, it seems that AI and space go together. While those examples are fiction, we are indeed starting to see examples in the real world where we are using artificial intelligence to help commercialize space. Satellites and spacecraft are complex and expensive pieces of equipment to put together. Within the spacecraft manufacturing operations, there are repetitive and complex tasks that need to be done with exacting measures of precision and often be done in clean rooms with little exposure to 
potential contamination. AI-enabled systems and robotics are being used to help the manufacturing process take and take away some of the tasks that humans currently do so that humans can focus on parts of that computers can't assemble. When working to assemble satellites, not only can AI help to physically speed up the process, but it can analyze the process itself to see if there are ways the process can be improved. In addition, the AI is also able to look at the work that has been performed and ensure that everything is done properly. Furthermore, the use of clever robots, cobots, as part of the manufacturing process are helping to reduce the need for human workers in clean rooms and make sure reliable manufacturing steps that can be ever prone. Satellites are generating thousands, if not millions of images every minute of the day. Satellites process about 150 terabytes of data every day. These images capture everything from weather and environmental imagery and data to images down to just inches of every inch of the globe. Capturing images of Earth automatically introduces a number of challenges and opportunities where AI is helping. Without AI, humans are mostly responsible for interpreting, understanding, and analyzing imagery. By the time a human gets around to interpreting an image, you may have to wait for the satellite to move back to its same position to further refine the image analysis. The power of deep learning and AI-enabled recognition provides significant powering, a power in analyzing Images and providing an ability to review the millions of images produced by a satellite, by a spacecraft. Artificial intelligence, on the other hand, can analyze the images as they are being taken and determine if there are any issues with the images. Unlike humans, AI does not need to sleep or take breaks, so it can rapidly process a lot of data. Using AI to capture images of Earth also prevents the need for large amounts of communication to in and from Earth to analyze photos and determine whether a new photo needs to be taken. By cutting back on communication, the AI is saving processing power, reducing battery usage, and speeding up the image uh, gathering process. Satellites also are also being used to analyze natural disasters from space. Detailed imagery from a satellite can help on help those on the ground to see victims, determine the course of the disaster and more. So we've talked about um, AI many times on here before. Um, they're just talking about the application of space um, exploration. Uh, it's actually a good application for it because you don't have a whole lot of leadway. Once it goes up, it, you're not, it's not coming back down for repair. Um, and the ability to actually uh, see AI is really only as good as the data that's fed to it. So it has to actually, in this case, it has to actually have um, accurate detail and data, you know, before it's actually, um, you know, usable in, in this application. But in space exploration, it makes a lot of sense. Um, that's why you know we talk about fourth industrialization because AI is one of those technologies that comes out of cyber connected systems. And so a satellite for all intents and purposes is a inter industrial internet of things. Um, it, it has a radio communication uh, uh, um, it has radio communications where it actually sends signals back and you actually communicate directly with it. Um, and you can add a processor like a Raspberry Pi or even something as complex as uh, uh, NVIDIA's uh, chip to do AI processing on it. And you don't need a big data center. You can use AWS now or Microsoft Azure, you know, for your um, your supercomputer. You can do all that stuff in real time. All you're doing is moving the, moving the data from one place to another, but it's all being handled in real time out in space. So therefore there's no reason to actually send any information back to do the processing. You're actually just sending information from the satellite or the spacecraft back after it's already been completed. So you can wait for the data. It's not a matter of send the data down and didn't do the processing. That raw data coming down like that is uh, very risky because it's, uh, it's, 
you, you're talking about uncompressed data coming down at 150 terabytes. That's, you know, that's pretty nasty coming down. Um, it's the equivalent of pushing a, bol uh, um, a boulder down a hill and then expecting it's, you know, for somebody to stop it when it comes down. Not good. Um, you want to do all that processing at the, um, at the device itself, at the edge itself. So edge computing in space is actually going to be something to pay attention to um, where you can do all your processing in real time out there. And then your satellite only has to do, do a few things and that's it. And then hands off the work to the edge, um, the edge uh, uh, computing. And then the edge hands, hands it off to the cloud and then the cloud does all the processing on the ground. And then you as the receiver would actually do the rest of the interpretation. So a lot can come out of uh, space exploration. It does not have to be this big lofty expense of trillions of dollars or billions of dollars. You can actually do this stuff for less than a million dollars now. Hey, Mike, got a question for you when it comes to AI. And yes, sir. This makes this may sound a, a little on the foolish side, but I guess when it comes to the programming of AI, are, are there like specialized you know, people just for that, or, or can you just take, I, I guess, any standard programmer to do that kind of stuff? Well, it depends on how complex you're trying to get into this. If you just need somebody that's going to develop an AI based application, um, then that you need like a team for that. If you're just trying to, um, you know, uh, create data sets, you don't, you only need one person for that. Okay. Um, so one person will curate the data. So somebody like engineering cannabis would be that person. Um, yeah. But to build out a whole entire AI platform, you're going to need a whole team for that. That's what we, we were talking about this the other day. It's called um, AI ops. Okay. So AI operations. Because like when I think of like data sets and whatnot, I'm thinking of like how SQL works. Yep, that's all it is. Okay. You're generating all this data. It's going into... Uh, it's, it's being created in small little sets. So one set for March 23rd, another set for March 22nd, for March 21st, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. And you're feeding that data into, you know, the um, the AI application itself and the AI application is doing all the processing on the back end and then spitting out the results later. Okay. Have you guys done, I guess, any, um, any reviews on like, uh, I guess, AI ethics? We did. We did that last year. Okay. Good. Yeah, the ethics behind. Yeah, we we've covered that before about police. Yeah, we were talking about how certain AI. Um, so like like say like in law enforcement, for example. Right. Um, a lot of robots that would be tested uh, couldn't like couldn't point out black folks, for example, or okay. couldn't make a determination or couldn't pick out certain people based on like melanin content because of like the cameras and the way the AI was reading things. And so, yeah, yeah we did cover some of that stuff last year. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The thing is um, we really got into AI ethics when we talking about law enforcement using the data that's been generated over the years to feed it to the AI system to determine the aggression of police um, monitoring, right? So how, you know, how dispatch, uh, um, you know, determines whether or not this sort of area needs to be policed or under policed or over policed or not. And if you had a lot of false or false arrests over the years because of the, uh, the drug, you know, the drug war, you know, that the government kind of placed all these drugs in this area and arrested all these people and they happen to be black, well, what's going to happen when you feed that data into the uh, AI? The AI is going to say, because of, of all the uh, information that's been given to it, it's going to say, yeah, police is over police this area. Yeah, if you're going on pre existing data sets, say, well, if you. I'm, oh, go ahead, Mike, I'm sorry. No, it's going to say that um, if, if you're using that, then what happens here is uh, the people will say, well, the AI can't be wrong. The AI said so. And then what happens there is that the um, the people who are, are, you know, the law enforcement itself, they don't know, they don't have a proper answer as to why they're being told to police this area. They're just being told to police this area. 
the AI is not going to know any difference anyway. All it's going to know is that this data has been fed to me. This is the decision I'm going to make at the end. But it, it, it's wrong to use, for, so from an ethics standpoint, it's wrong to use AI and law enforcement in this country. It's wrong to use it. Okay. Thank you. Yep, no problem. Uh, we got Jay on the panel, man. What's going on? Hello? Put some volume on your mic, brother. Uh, can you hear me better now? Yep. Oh, yeah, I just wanted to add in, um, if you're interested in AI machine learning, the MATLAB machine learning toolbox is pretty cheap. Mm -hmm. um, it's a pretty easy way to get started. Um, there's a lot of stuff online, a lot of material to help mm -hmm. you get started. Um, and it'll, it's kind of, there's like a GUI tool. So you can import your data sets, um, train your algorithm using the GUI, and it'll generate code for you. And, and you can look, study the code, see what it's doing. Mm -hmm. Just want to throw that in there if anybody's interested. Yeah, MATLAB is good stuff. Yeah, it's a little bit easier to get started than with like Python, for example. Mm -hmm. So actually, um, on the site, there's one example. It's pretty cool. Um, where um, MATLAB is an example where they give you like different bird songs, like three different type of birds. They give you the data sets and you train the algorithm and then. Um, your your machine learning algorithm will be able to identify the same bird with a new data set. So mm. just throwing that out there. Yeah, it's good stuff. That's good stuff. I forgot about MATLAB all this time too. So uh, thanks for the contribution. Um, next item on the dock is from Engadget.com. No, 5G didn't start the pandemic. Do we really have to talk about this? In the manosphere, you might have to talk about this. <laughs> The advent of COVID-19 has sparked a whole new wave of paranoia among people who believe in the 5G conspiracy theory. Folks are suggesting newfangled wireless signals are somehow acting as shepherd for the global pandemic, or worse, what, that 5G and the coronavirus are the tools of a shadowy new world order to turn us all into mindless zombies. Suffice to say, here's a patient explanation on why they are very, very wrong. You'll have seen the hype about new 5G networks slowly rolling out across the globe and the devices that can harness the 5G power. Over the next few years, the average speed of our wireless internet is going to skyrocket with capacity getting broad enough to enable whole new industries. If you listen to the fear mongers, however, you may wind up thinking that 5G is an unsafe bleeding edge technology that hasn't been tested enough. It's easy to paint a picture of shadowy trucks delivering sinister glowing 5G boxes across the US. But 5G isn't a plot point in the, in the 80s movie. It's just a catch-all term for a rather boring collection of wireless technology that's newer than what we had before. Hence the fifth generation of fifth, uh, cellular technology as an upgrade on the fourth uh, generation. Not every entity, entity in the telecom space agrees on what 5G means because every company has upgraded its network differently. AT&T, for instance, was slammed for adding a 5GE logo on its existing handsets that could take advantage of faster LTE speeds but not, connected, not connect to true 5G networks. As we explained in a recent episode of Upscaled, 5G is really about redesigning antennas and new cell towers that can harness the broader spectrum. At the risk of oversimplifying this, 5G is just 4G LTE, but with new algorithms making it faster and they're theoretically more reliable. But you didn't see the usual dim corners of the internet claiming that 4G made everyone contract SARS. Ah, but what about millimeter wave? You paid for Verizon show who uh, profits from our collective misery, asks the conspiracy theorists. Well, millimeter wave is the only new component of 5G. It enables your devices to transmit and receive data on the 30 to 300 gigahertz bands. 
the fear mongers claim that millimeter wave is a new, more harmful form of radiation that penetrates our skin, weakens our cells, makes us more susceptible to infection and gives us cancer. That's not true. In fact, millimeter wave is, is a far weaker set of signals than traditional 3G and 4G transmissions. It's fine in open, open areas with lots of cell towers, like built up cities, but won't even penetrate tinted glass or most buildings. Millimeter wave signals are even blocked by inner layer of our skin. So the idea it's going to turn our bodies to, uh, to goop is wrong. And 5G has been around, I'm uh, sorry, has been in the work since 2011. So there's been plenty of time to avoid such an outcome. Like a lot of conspiracy theories, the suggestion that there's a connection between 5G and the coronavirus pandemic requires a lot of logical leaps. The implication that the virus broke out just weeks after the first 5G rollout in China is just putting two events side by side and hoping for a link. But the general implication is that 5G phones and networks are creating a form of radiation sickness that will wipe out billions. We are intentionally not linking out to uh, conspiracy websites and sources, but you can find them across YouTube. <laughs> Interesting they mentioned YouTube. Reddit and elsewhere if you feel so motivated. On Twitter, a notable entertainer recently tweeted to two plus million followers that coronavirus was the effects of radiation and that when 5G was activated in China, people dropped dead. Another theory suggests that 5G, which was created by Bill Gates, emits sinister radiation to keep us at a low vibrational state, a state designed to depopulate the world. But in the next line, it claims that the world's population will be vaccinated against the virus. Hmm. Except it's not a vaccine, but the impl implantation of a tiny chip that's, that'll sit inside our bodies, monitoring our thoughts and activities, given our uh, given the pop power requirements uh, such a device would need, even if brain to computer interfaces existed, you'd need a pretty big sy uh, syringe. Then again, it's usually true that a conspiracy theory falls apart under the lightest scrutiny, especially when science gets involved. Sadly, it's often the case that people radicalized by those theories will simply dismiss any evidence that disputes their view. Another problematic theory suggests that Bill and Melinda Gates have engineered the virus for their own needs. This one is based on a lack of understanding regarding some patent documents, a belief that Bill Gates has hidden political influence and sheer coincidence. Oh boy. The Gates Foundation supports a number of scientific bodies, including the Perbright Institute. Perbright was set up to monitor viral diseases with a focus on illness that could be transmitted from farm animals to humans. A few years ago, it developed a patent for, live, for a livestock vaccine for poultry against a coronavirus. It's worth remembering that coronavirus is the general term for a group of repository tract infections rather than something novel itself. SARS and MERS, two famous viral outbreaks from the last two decades are both coronaviruses. The coronavirus, which we are discussing now, is more properly called SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19. A Netflix documentary about pandemics recently quoted Gates too. He spoke about viruses coming from China and how unprepared we are for one that could prove fatal and widespread. His point was the world needs to invest more in vaccine research and or face the consequences. But this isn't something Gates is doing as a victory rap, a tell, uh, a tell for the conspiracy theorists to confirm their suspicion. He advocated for expanded vaccine research for years. Watch this clip of him saying pretty much the same thing as at a TED talk in the wake of Ebola back in 2015. The science, we reach out to every major US carrier along the manufacturers in the wireless networking space, all declined to speak on the record. 
with unnamed entities saying they did not wish to inflame the topic. Several of them referred to the uh, to the cellular telecommunications Inter internet association, CETIA, a group that represents the wireless telecoms industry as a whole. In a statement, the CETIA said that the science of COVID-19 was undisputed in that animals are the source of the coronavirus. It also supplies references from the World Health Organization and Centers for Disease and Control to confirm its stance. Those bodies said that COVID-19, as well as MERS and SARS, were transmitted between animals and people. The CDC added that pattern of transmission originated in bats and transmitted to people from an animal reservoir in China. We spoke to a network engineer who similarly asked to remain anonymous for fears of reprisal, who explained, who explained the science. They said that one issue is the, conf the conflation of ionizing and non-ionizing radiation, believing that they are the same thing. Ionizing radiation is the type that is dangerous, emanating from radioactive material and with the potential to break down atomic structures. Non-ionizing by comparison is a low strength, relatively harmless set of waves that we have used for years, like to power long wave radio. The expert added that as well as there being no interaction between non-ionizing radiation, it couldn't happen at the low powers that cellular networks use anyways. And with regards to millimeter wave, there's no reason to consider this to have a unique effect. He said, to tackle concerns about ionizing radiation and communication networks, the UK wireless regulator Ofcom conducted a study earlier this year. As reported by BBC News, at the highest level of exposure, the local wireless signal produced 0.039% of the recommended safe limit. Fundamentally, there's no science or even logic that supports the claim that 5G has anything to do with COVID-19. After all, 5G, 5G is often a gimmicky way to get people excited about faster wireless speeds, and the other is a global pandemic with an already identified cause. So this debate has been going on for quite a bit in the manosphere. I hope this piece actually addresses this and people do not bring this up ever again. Yeah, because, you know, it's in places where 5G isn't. Yeah. You know, it's kind of a... God damn. Where do people get this shit, dude? Um, the problem with Black people in particular, I, this article is really addressing Black people who are pushing this sort of perspective. The, the problem with Black people is they're always looking for a boogeyman. There's a boogeyman approach to everything. Right. It's got to be, you know, the brother chasing the white girl. It's got to be, you know, you know, it's base is not real. It's got to be. Five it's got to be like it's, it's yeah. got to be like the like the shit. Uh, it used to be on the Scooby Doo cartoons, right? Where they catch the culprit and then they fucking pull off the mask and then. <laughs> You know what I mean? It's always like like the boogie, like you said, the boogeyman. It's something behind somebody behind something, right? Like you got to catch the culprit. Then who are you really? And then you pull the mask off, right? And then it's just like, <gasps> and it's like some person that you knew all along, and he's just like, I would have got away if it wasn't for you meddling Negroes. You know, what I'm yeah. like it always has to be that kind of scenario. <laughs> you know, I, uh, a few weeks ago there was a guy on here. I was debating on this on this exact same topic. I teach radiation physics. I mean, I go through the whole EM spectrum. I deal with ionizing and non-ionizing radiation. And that article pretty much states what it is. I mean, because basically radio waves, and the worst you can get is microwaves. Now, microwaves will burn skin because they break down water molecules. And that's what those gigantic big towers are. They are, they are sending microwaves, but ain't nobody sending next to this stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and it's like... Because once he, 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 they're trying to say it's going to give you cancer. Don't, there are only two forms that'll give you cancer x rays, gamma rays. That's basically it. Um, you might get it from alpha particles or beta particles, but that comes from radioactive decay. This You'll stuff definitely get it from beta particles. Yeah. Now, beta, 
Yeah, but Beta I'm Park. Is, <laughs> yeah, you got to get through. Um, you got to get through clothing. So Beta Park, they can be blocked by like you know, pretty like a thick coat. All right. Yeah, as long as the stuff doesn't get in, inside your body, it's not ingested. You're gonna be fine. Yeah, I wonder if the guys wearing skinny jeans that that might. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, Jay Blaze. Yes. Just one addition. Um, of course, ultraviolet radiation can also give you cancer. Yes, because it, 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 yeah, because that one will burn. It, it'll, it, it will burn you. Those daggone tanning beds. Mm -hmm. Hey Jay, what's your name in the chat? Is it Jordan Zavi? No. Is, is your? Did you type in the chat? No, I've never actually typed in the chat before. Okay, I was gonna. Um, I'm trying to identify who you are. So. All right. Um, oh, do you need some from me or something? Yeah, we just want to make sure we identify everybody who comes from the chat onto the panel. So, um, it's not necessary right now. Okay. All right. Last item on the document is from interestingengineering.com. How long do you want to live? This technology could potentially help people live forever. Imagine Pookie, a million years old. The coronavirus may have you thinking about your mortality. At the end of the day, humans only have one life on this planet. Even more so, we are pretty fragile, prone to disease, uh, destructive, and a bit st uh, stubborn. Since the beginning of time, humans have longed for eternal life, the ability to extend one's life and youth far beyond its current limits. Nevertheless, you have to give humans their props for increasing their species life expectancy across the board over the last 200 years. For the uninitiated, life expectancy is the expected number of years of life remaining at a particular age. Yet, as you probably already wondering, how long can humans live? According to our world in data, the average life expectancy is 72.6 years old, yet as you are probably aware, there are select groups of people, there goes that term again, across the world, especially in wealthier nations that have well exceeded this number. Some people have gone on to live 100 years, 110 years, and even beyond with Jean Kalman of France living 122 years and 164 days. What are you doing at that age? But can humans live even longer? If you could, how long would you want to live? 200 years, 500 years, maybe a full millennium. Though this might seem like a bit of science fiction, technology could advance to the point where humans could live forever. In fact, some futurists argue that if you make it to 2050, you are probably not going to die. So stay inside, please. Futurists... <laughs> Funny, right? Do Futurist Dr. Ian Pearson have gone on to argue that by using the power of technology, humanity might be able to merge our minds with machines, making our bodies obsolete. You could end up attending your own body funeral. Pearson paints the picture of this future, stating one day your body dies and with it, your brain stops. But no big problem because 99% of your mind is still fine, running happily on IT in the cloud, assuming you saved enough and prepared well, you connect to an Android to use as your body from now on, attending your funeral and then carrying on before. Still you, just with a younger, highly upgraded body. This is humans 2.0 that they're talking about, fifth industrial. I was gonna say, because if you're doing that, then what you're doing then is you could probably then beam down from the cloud into like a robotic body. Yeah, to be yeah. beach to be terrestrial again. That's some yep. That's some next level. Yeah, that's that's human uh, human two point but fifth industrialization. Um, maybe this is what they were referring to in Terminator. Shit. Yeah, Rev Nine. Hmm. And this, that's interesting. Yeah, this is just the beginning. Beyond twenty fifty, there could be many different ways you may be able to preserve your mind and consciousness. Humans might just switch to different humanoid bodies after a certain period of 
uh, period, the same way you might buy a new car with new features. Or thanks to projects like Neuralink, your mind may just be a few simple clicks away from downloading yourself into a computer or a robotic body, maybe thousands of years from now. All of humanity may decide it is better for humans to live in a massive megastructure that practically generates our own reality. Today, that- Dude, what did we just literally just say? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Today, that is what we are going to explore. There is plenty of technology out there that could potentially change the entire direction of humanity, posing the question, will humans eventually be able to live forever? Like most of the things on the list, on this list, this sounds like something out of science fiction film. Yet people like University of Southern California's Theodore Berger, Duke University's Mikhail Lib Libidev, and Alexander Kaplan of Moscow University all believe it's possible. There are already companies out there working on ways to link our minds to machines. At the moment, there are more practical reasons for this like offering those who have the have mobility disabilities the ability to live more normal and fulfilling lives. However, it can go even further than that. The mind will be in the cloud and be able to use any Android that you feel like to, in, uh, to inhabit the real world, says Pearson. It could get to a point in which you can hire an Android body for the day. Rather than traveling to Jamaica, just upload your brain to an asteroid, or to an Android uh, station in Jamaica, or maybe there's a great con uh, concert that you want to see, but the band is in another city thousands of miles away. You may be able to simply upload yourself to experience the show. The result of this is that humans may never need a fleshy body again. See, this is this is kind of let me let me just challenge this real quick. Holograms right. and virtual reality already here. I'm, and I'm assuming by 2050, this is all going to be mm -hmm. very much polished. You would not need to actually travel anywhere if mm -hmm. you can go in the cloud and actually be beamed down to a VR headset. What, what, what's the value of actually traveling anywhere other than for the environment itself? Have you seen the movie Altered? I mean, the TV Wait, series going Altered to the actual. Ultra Carbon? I've, I've never watched it. Go, go ahead. No, no Ultra Carbon's on Netflix. Mm -hmm. Basically, this is this sounds no. very much like this. But what they do in this series, your brain is in this thing called a stack. Yeah. And you can take this stack and put it in different bodies. They call them, the bodies are now called sleeves. Mm -hmm. Okay. But they, they can also beam you, I guess, to like different locations if need be. So yeah. That's where I was thinking about it. That's that's mm -hmm. the that's so, where I was thinking about it, where now we're talking in, we're talking like you know interplanetary. Yeah, yeah, right. We're talking teleportation. Yeah, but I'm talking about imagine like you're yeah. saying like uploading. So let's just say your sleeve it dies. You get a backup copy of your consciousness, you just pull it back. Yeah. Yeah, you just back it like 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 we back up devices and shit. Yeah, you just put it on a yeah. blockchain. Yeah. Where's engineering cannabis when you need them? Um, in the chat. <laughs> I don't think he's there. Uh, <laughs> however, it can go even further than that. The mind will be in the cloud and be. Uh, well, I think I've read all the story. <clears throat> you may be able to simply upload yourself to an experience to show the result of this is that humans may never need a fleshy body again. 3D printing has come a long way, virtually impacting almost every major industry across the world, including healthcare. Just in the past couple of years, researchers from separate organizations and private institutions have found ways to 3D print organs. A team of researchers from Tel Aviv University in Israel unveiled a 3D printed heart with human tissue and, and vessels just like last year, or just last year. Companies like Scorpio Medical have gone as far to begin research in the realms of 3D printed limbs. In the near future, you may be able to simply renew a body part when it goes bad. 
your body gets more and more limited as you get older. Advances in biotechnology could put an end to this. Even more so, genetic engineering could eventually prevent the aging of cells or completely reverse it altogether. Lose a finger, simply print a new one. Need a new arm. I, I was oh. going to say, I think... Oh, I'm sorry, Mike, go ahead. I was out of comment. Go ahead. Call up a doctor and have them re reinstall one. So imagine you're going like, you have like Amazon Prime and, you know, you got jumped by some uh, by some uh, maggles out there. You lose an arm, man. You know, no problem. Let's say Amazon Prime drops it off and some kind of drone or something. Go ahead. <laughs> I was just gonna say, man. Um, you know, that's that's where like the CRISPR technology comes in. You know, gene editing. Yeah. You know, you, you just edit the goddamn aging gene. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cryogenic freezing has its fish. Which I would imagine, dude, I, I would imagine at some point, dude, there, there's some people, there's some uber rich motherfuckers out here that have done it. I'm convinced of it. Mm -hmm. I'm convinced of it. I'm convinced that there are some uber rich people that have already done that. Yeah, Jeffrey Epstein. Um... Cryogenic freezing has its fair share of skeptics, but over the years, the scientific community has slowly embraced the idea. Now you cannot freeze yourself yet and wake up, but there could be a future in which you simply put your body on ice for extended periods of time to be awakened on a given date and time or time. This could come in handy during- Now people have done that too, cryogenics. Yeah. You know, cryogenics, there's people that are frozen in cryogenic. Yeah, I think you might be having some issues with your uh, chambers right now. Yeah, you, you think you might be having some issues with your. Okay, doctors. all right. Let me. I'm gonna drop out and come back in. All right. This could come in handy during trips to distant planets, hundreds of light years away. Nevertheless, cryogenic freezing is simply an option for people who want to freeze their bodies when they pass away, with the aims of bringing them back during a time period when where science makes it possible. However, there is some research that centers around using cryo, uh, cryonics to slow tissue aging. Interesting. You have probably heard it before, but we are probably living in a virtual world, at least that is one uh, people, uh, that is one people who buy into simulation theory uh, believe. However, in the coming age of electronic immorality, Living in the virtual world may become an alternative, alternative to living in the current one. Think of it like that episode on San uh, Jun Junipero from the popular Netflix series Black Mirror. Perhaps in the future, androids are extremely expensive, but the cheap alternative is to have some humans uploaded into a cloud-based virtual reality system, a place where you could spend all eternity living in peace with an avatar of your uh, of your choosing. Most people already live on the internet. Some, in most cases, it is just a matter of time. Hmm. I would say that people who do you know eight, ten hour live streams, I would say they live on the internet too. I knew you. Yeah, they definitely must live on it. But what could come after uh, creating a virtual world? Though this could. Far, um, this could happen far beyond 2050. We are talking thousands of years. It could be possible. In short, humanity might be able to simulate reality on a universal scale using what is known as a metro shika brain. Metro, uh, Mastrokia brain. Based on the Dyson Spear, a Mastrokia brain is a hypothetical megastructure proposed by Robert J. Bradbury. The idea was proposed when imagining the type of highly advanced civilizations that are, are out there in the universe as this would be an impressive class B stellar engine, employing the entire energy output of a star to drive computer systems. We're gonna go there. Yeah, that, who, who came up with this? This is a uh, fifth industrialization. Um, Interesting. Wait, no, who who did it, who did they say came up with that? It was Bradbury? Yeah. 
Bottom shelf Brad. What was the name? Robert J. Bradbury. Yeah, man. So this is uh, Robert J. Bradbury. Okay. Seems like those are these are those these are those areas that we're talking about, dude. That are just they're, they're wide open. Oh yeah. I mean, we talked about this last year. Last think time. about it. Think about if you think about it. Yeah. Think, think about you. You own that area of development, man. Yeah, complex. I think you might have to update your software. Um, your, your okay, hold on. Let your me software try. might might need to be updated. You have to uh, get off the uh, the panel and then update it. Yeah, the, the, the thing I was just mentioning was that um, last year we covered an article by some scientists who uh, were able to use a brain computer interface um, on a human and on a mouse. And they were able to transfer their thoughts to a mouse or whatever they were thinking to the mouse and the mouse would actually react to it. So if they wanted the mouse, or if they wanted to think about the mouse moving to the you know to one side of the the cage or the one side of the container, um, the mouse is actually moving. Very interesting, you know, sort of neural linking of of thoughts. Um, now I haven't. I know they tried it on like a um, a, a monkey or something like that before, um, but they never. I never. I can't remember what the results were. However, what I'm thinking here is that man, if you can control animals in that way. Imagine you, you, you know. I mean, this is like Planet of the Apes. It's crazy. I see, man. You know, people gonna be. I'm assuming people are the final solution. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We are gonna start with my, you know, start with mice, and you know, work our way up. Eventually, man, somebody's gonna be trying to control humans. Yeah. They're gonna anti-life equation. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's what people have been worried about, right? The, the, the um. Uh, what's the um, cyber? No, not cybernetics. Um, uh, the thing from Terminator. Um, what Skynet? Skynet would come down and, and, and you know beam them up, Scotty, and try to you know eviscerate them. I you know I'm not saying that they're that far off the base, but you know, yeah, you you, you know you really. I mean, at this point, between now and 2035, 2040. Yeah, there's going to be a war between technocrats and and, and uh, the Luddites. Hey, Mike, do I sound okay now? Yeah. Okay. Um. Oh uh, shit, I had a point, man. I, I totally, I totally had a point. Oh, I was gonna say it's also similar to Avatar, to some extent or some degree, where yeah. you're kind of biolocating yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean that's that's the lesson that that's the next level tech right there, man. Yeah, a lot of people don't really realize, man, that, um, yeah, we're, we're only like seven minutes from midnight, you know, from having a, um, having a civil war between technocrats and, uh, and these Luddites, man. These are, and I say Luddites because I use the term loosely because, I mean, there's no real other way to just, to really describe these people. You know, they hate space. They hate science. They're very anti-science. They're anti-intellectual. Well, yeah, well, no, no. I mean, that would be the modern that would be the modern uh, depiction of them because the closest thing you have to uh, something like that 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 uh, that in terms of uh, a modern context would be Luddites. Okay, they had they had a defined fear of the cultural impact of technology. They're like kind of like the first group to specifically sort of outline. Uh, the reasons why they had a they had an issue with innovation. Yeah. Yeah. Now with these these luddites, I mean, I, I'm not really. I, I've heard the term. Um, I, I, now I, I'm kind of getting the context of what you're saying. But so now are they are these folks who like completely abandoned a technology, or or did or they pick and choose? No, they they hate the advancement of technology, and so. When you start talking about like electric cars and stuff like that, these are the people who who who, who stand in front of the ISIN station, right? Okay. Um, 
you know, they, they those are the Luddites. Um, okay. Yeah, they, they always, uh, you know, keying up, you know, people's Teslas and Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, Th those folks, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I just saw um, an article that um, that's in the Brain Trust email um, that was sent saying um, a, a, a woman unplugged someone's Tesla while it was charging. Mm. Oh. Yeah. And you know, like, like what, why would you do that? Why would you do that? It happens all the time. It happens here all the time. People, you know, it, 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 you just have these, uh, like I said, these Luddites, man, they can't stand the fact that, you know, you're charging your vehicle on public infrastructure. So you see here, we have public charging stations set up. I think they're just 110 outlets though, uh, 120 outlets. And, um, you know, it, it might take you six hours, eight hours to charge your car. So you might park your car in this space, but this this asshole comes by and decides I'm going to unplug your vehicle and let you and let you uh, not have a charge. So what happened here recently was that a person had just parked their um, their Tesla, and it was um, and this is separate from the article. Dude. I'm just bringing up this point because this happened locally. This person had park, pulled up to park to charge their Tesla, and the Sentry camera actually caught the um, the the um, you know the vandal unplugging the Tesla only about twenty minutes after the Tesla was just plugged in for charging, and the, and the Tesla needed to be charged. It was low on battery. Right. And so, what you have is these people, man, who who are just I, I don't know. I don't know what what's going through their heads. You know, they're just really angry. At technology, they hate it. You know, um, you know, they put their, um, you know, their, uh, you know, their smartphones in chip bags because it has aluminum foil on the inside. You know, to block the signal. It's really crazy, sort of people walking around, not really mentally stable at all. You see it in the manosphere a lot. You know, don't use five G. Um, you know, don't be going to. Um, you know, don't don't put your avatar on on uh, this really out there. They're really out there with some of their ideas. You know, there's no such thing as space. There's no such thing as the moon. It's a hologram. It's made of cheese. Um, <laughs> it does it's out there, man. They're really really out there with some of their ideas, man. It's just you know, I'm always going to use fiat currency, paper money. Who needs this cryptocurrency stuff? It's, it's unbelievable sometimes. It's like, yeah, man. It, 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 I mean, I, I don't, dude, sometimes it, it's kind of like, you know, man, if you really just kind of follow the, the actual news, like if you, if you, if you're, what you're putting into your brain literally has everything to do with what goes on in the world, how things go on in the world. Okay. What you'll quickly find is that a lot of concepts that people hold are, are, you know, they'll find that they're, they're patently false. Yeah. Um, there's a scene in the movie I'm always reminded of. Um, it's uh, the movie, The Network. Mm -hmm. And there's literally, there's a scene. Um, um, you can even look it up. It's, it's a famous movie scene. Uh, it's called The State of Things. So mm -hmm. you can just type in The Network 1976 and then put The State of Things. And it's essentially, you know, not to, di you know, not to digress too much, but basically it was a, it was a, um, an Alex Jones type of um, type type of uh, personality who was on the air, conspiracy theorist, all this type of stuff, whatever. And so he had been railing about how the air, you know, at the time, you know, it was the Arabs that was just like they were the damn enemy, much like how you know we were being told, Mike, today that China's the enemy, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so basically, what ends up happening is he ends up work. He he's he's he becomes a, a big time celebrity big time media personality and he's working for a company that is uh in the process of being 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 purchased by a group of uh arab businessmen so he he, he basically his anti-arab rants essentially uh result in the arabs pulling out of the deal for the uh for the network to be bought and so his boss the the dude who runs the network pulls him into a, a conference room and basically proceeds to explain to him how the world works and at the end of the whole conversation, which was really just sort of like a five minute speech to him, he, he had this realization, the light bulb went off, dude. And he, he, at that point, he got a clue as to how this all works. I would suggest everybody who's listening, 
look that um that that movie clip up it's the movie's called the network the year is 1976 and the clip is called the state of things today look that up no no i mean like i said man um uh, you see a lot of these luddites in the management um I always want to and fight. Well, Mike, the, Mike, the reason why I point that clip out because it was literally like a technocrat and a Luddite having a conversation. Mm-hmm. And it was almost, it was like, you got the light bulb to go off in the Luddite and he got it. It's one of the most, it's one of the most, um, it's one of the most iconic uh, movie scenes. Check it out, man. I'll text it to you, Mike. Well, you know, here, let me dig it up. and I'll, I'll just post it. Yeah, that's the thing, man. I'm just pointing out that the manosphere, you know, it has a lot of Luddites in it. You know, um, all these people, they they use Apple products, but they don't actually want Siri listening to them. And so, it, you know, they turn their phones upside down, you know, uh, you know, put it on its face so that they think it's not listening to them or they'll put it in a blanket or something like that. Um, they hate Siri, but they love the touch screen. They love, you know, Porn hub and so on and so forth. Um, it, it's 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 a really weird relationship, man. Um, that I think a lot of the times for Black people, um, the superstitious mindset uh, is coming from a lack of ed- education. The least, the less education they tend to have, the more reluctant they seem to be about anything progressive. And most of the people that I've met that are very progressive tend to be highly educated um, or have some moderate forms of edu- uh, post-secondary education. They seem to have done well for themselves in terms of like uh, academia. Um, and so I bring all that up because I just find that to be interesting that these articles are pointing this type of stuff out about you know the 5G conspiracy theorists and stuff like that. Um, you, you do see a lot of that in, in black communities, um, just people just not really, you know, not really all that there uh, mentally. Um, you know, people saying that you can't get the COVID virus because you're black and, you know, even though you're more, sure. <laughs> even though you're more um, susceptible to, uh, you know, to this type of stuff, man. Um, I don't know. I don't know. It's just, it's just very interesting. Jay, you have any uh, last comments you want to um, bring up? Oh, just real quick. I was just going to say, I posted the link. So everybody, you know, check it out. Oh, no, I'm good. All right. Uh, Johnny Blaze. Also good, man. Hey, love the content. <laughs> Thanks, man. Um, we're going 11. I think the goal is gone. Um, yeah, Complex, you got anything you want to say? Oh, no, that was it, man. Um, it, just check out, you know, everybody, check out that link I posted, man. I, I want I want everybody, actually, I want everybody to check that out. So, you know, if you catch this on the replay, just pull it up on the live, on the live chat, and the link is there. I want you guys to really take in what this dude what what i'm trying to remember the actor's name but what he says you got to really take it in that's all i got bro till next time uh jay you were gonna say something um actually i was muted but um oh um just want to uh share something with you guys you guys were talking about solar probe a while ago parker solar probe you said soul plane solar probe Oh, solar probe. So plain. Yeah, yeah. So um, actually, the the project manager is a black guy. Okay. Yeah, just factoid, throwing that out there. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know that. I know that. Hmm. Okay. All right, man. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Please hit the like button if you've not already done so. Share the video if possible. Hit that notification bell so you get all the updates from the Black Brain Trust. When those posts on the community tab. Docker description beneath the video for you to follow along with. Shalom, everyone.